This video is brought to you by my wonderful supporters over on Patreon. By supporting the channel for less than $2 American a month, you can get early access to videos, the ability to download episodes, and nearly 100 original music tracks. A very special thank you to my executive producer tier patrons, Ezra Hambrick, Mason Collin, Aussie, Die Castinator, Chuck K45, Miles Garrett, and King GTA 15. All of you are amazing, and your support is something I can't fully express my gratitude for. Thank you all so much. And this episode is brought to you in part by my executive producers, Ezra Hambrick, Mason Collin, Chuck K45, and Die Castinator. You can check out Ezra's YouTube channel, Scott Games 99, where they play games such as NHL and MLB, and story based games like the Red Dead Redemption series, with plenty more story based games to come. Mason Collins' podcast channel, We're About Everything, where they discuss, well, everything from zombie apocalypses to game remasters and more. Chuck K45's channel, who's working on setting up a channel all about buying farm equipment, fixing it up, and starting a new farm from scratch. And Diecastinator's channel, where they examine, review, and discuss all things diecast, from the history of the hobby to rare models and much more, with new videos basically every day, in addition to buying, selling, and trading the diecast cars. All links in the description down below. Thank you to all of my patrons, and please consider signing up if you enjoy my content. Every little bit helps, people. Even if you can't support me financially, though, support the show by showing my executive producers some love. And without further ado, enjoy today's video. So, Grand Theft Auto, we're back at it again it seems, and we have many more titles in the series to eventually cover. But for now, for the GTA episodes anyway, I'll be going in the order that I originally played them in, at least I think, and giving my actual thoughts on the game beyond the exaggerated perspectives of mine that you may get from GTA biographies. Oh right, if you're a GTA fan and you haven't already seen my GTA lore series, GTA Biographies, go check it out, you will enjoy it, believe me. So as usual, a little bit of my background on this game first. I'm pretty sure I went over this in my episode on Vice City, but for the sake of thoroughness, I'll go through this real quick. So I started with Vice City all the way back in either 2002 or 2003 probably, and played it all the time with my best friend at the time over at his house. Well, at some point between then and the release of the next GTA game, my dad stopped playing his PS2, which he usually only used for sports games, and gave the console to me. Well, you can bet that when GTA San Andreas released, my buddy and I were both ready to play the ever-loving crap out of it. But I distinctly remember going with my dad to rent it from Blockbuster and being told that they had to recall all of their copies for some reason that I didn't understand at the time. Hot coffee, baby. If somehow you aren't aware, Rockstar Games had at one point considered implementing a full-on sex minigame in GTA San Andreas that was cut at some point prior to the final release. But somehow, the files for this minigame were not fully removed from the game's code, and were thus accessible to those who knew how to mod the systems, like the original Xbox or PS2. Again, you couldn't actually access these minigames normally, but their very presence on the disc prompted the ESRB to re-rate the game from M for Mature to the dreaded adults only, meaning places like Blockbuster couldn't even sell it. Well, naturally, the game was re-released with all the naughtiness removed, and I was finally able to get my hands on it. And as I'm sure comes as no shock to anybody, I freaking loved it. I spent so much time with this game that I couldn't even fathom a guess at the number of hours I must have sunk into it. But like most of my GTA experiences back then, I know for sure that I cheated my way through the game for the most part, and it wouldn't be until years and years later when I streamed the game on this channel that I would play through it legitimately. Uh, mostly. But believe it or not, that playthrough was the first time that I had replayed the game without relying heavily on cheats since I was little, since, although I'd replayed it to record footage for my show, GTA Biographies, I'd done so under time constraints, and had not just cheated, but modded to hasten the process to get out new episodes. So now I'm going to step back into San Andreas without ever hopefully using a single cheat, or looking up a single thing, but... We will absolutely not be going for 100% this time around, so beyond the main story, the side things I do will be entirely at my own discretion. And for the record, no, I am not playing the Definitive Edition, I am playing the Steam version after I've operated on it extensively. A little open heart surgery to make the game function as intended, but nothing that otherwise changes the base experience, just, you know, the stuff that should have been there, like widescreen resolutions, proper controller support, and stabilization. All right. Let's start this sucker up and see how it holds up nearly 20 years after the fact.
Well, I'm not going to go over all of the backstory leading up to the game's beginning, since I already did that in the GTA biographies, but basically, as a refresher, Carl Johnson was a high-ranking member of the Grove Street Families gang led by his older brother, Sean Sweet Johnson, until 1987. Something happened that year which resulted in their younger brother, Brian, being killed, and CJ was largely viewed as at least partially responsible for the accident, although it's never explained exactly. CJ spent five years on the East Coast stealing cars for Joey Leone in Liberty City, the GTA universe's equivalent to New York, and then in 1992, for reasons we'll get into, CJ's mother Beverly is accidentally killed during an assassination attempt, likely aimed at Sweet. With the news of his mother's death, he returns to Los Santos, this universe's version of Los Angeles, for the funeral. Well, almost immediately upon returning, CJ gets harassed by some corrupt cops working for the city's crash division, based on a real-life former LA Police Department division that was supposed to be tasked with bringing down gang-related crimes in the city. After being reintroduced to officers Frank Tenpenny and Eddie Pulaski, with Tenpenny being voiced by the incredible Samuel L. Jackson, CJ is also framed for the murder of another police officer, Ralph Pendlebury, whom the crash trio just murdered themselves to cover up their own corruption. Welcome home, Carl. Glad to be back. You haven't forgotten about us, have you, boy? Hell no, Officer Tenpenny. I was just wondering what took y'all so long. Already framed for murder and under Tenpenny's thumb, CJ is thrown from the cop car into an alley in the middle of enemy gang territory and forced to make his own way back to Grove Street, home. Ah, oh, shit. Here we go again. Now, so far, the characterization, cutscenes, voice acting, and presentation has made it very clear what kind of story this will be, at least for the game's first section, and the game's primary media influences are worn on its sleeve. Movies like Menace to Society, Boys in the Hood, and Colors were very clearly on the developers' minds when crafting the story and writing its main cast of characters, as well as some other films like Martin Scorsese's Casino, which we'll get into much later on. MC8, who starred in Menace to Society, even plays one of our main Grove Street homies, Ryder. Overall, this first section of the game sets up the motivations and backstories of the main characters really well, though as we go on, we'll definitely see some missteps, or at the very least, curveballs, as we stray further from the Grove Street vs. Bala's gang story. Oh yeah, I haven't actually mentioned them yet, so the Grove's main enemies are a rival gang called the Bala's. For the longest time, my whiter than wonderbread ass couldn't understand the name and thought that it sounded silly. Why would a bunch of gangsters call themselves that? But, as has been pointed out to me many times now, the name is like Ballin' or just looking cool, which makes a whole lot more sense. Thank you to the 17,456 people who have pointed this out to me in the comments. I now know the error of my ways. So anyway, we begin the trek back to Grove Street, and you may or may not notice that, as I said in my GTA Vice City episode, I'm a bit of a in-between-the-white-lines kind of a player. I mean... In between saves, I might go on a rampage shooting civilians and causing chaos, but I'll usually reload an older save during my main, serious, if you will, playthrough. I like to kind of roleplay. That means not going out of my way to run over peds on the sidewalks or get into shootouts with the cops, but being perfectly fine with winding up in the random shootout with the ballers or something like that. We'll see how long I can actually keep this up though, since the game tends to have chaos regardless of your actions. You can just make more of it if you want. Back at Grove Street, we run into an old friend of CJ's and the source of a notorious meme, Melvin Big Smoke Harris, who was, for some reason, hanging out in the Johnson family home alone while everyone was on their way to the funeral. That's odd. Perhaps even suspicious? Anyway, we drive Smoke over to the cemetery on the west side of the city to meet with our brother Sweet and sister Kendall, as well as another old friend, Ryder, whom I mentioned earlier, and within moments, the whole thing devolves into bickering between the Johnson siblings. Kendall gets fed up and starts to leave, but Sweet gives her hell knowing she's going back to her boyfriend, Caesar, who is part of a rival Mexican gang. Carl tries to defend Kendall's right to see whoever she wants, but it's no use, and Kendall's boyfriend of choice isn't the only thing Sweet is pissed about. See, in the five years since CJ left, the Grove has fallen on hard times, in part because of the crack cocaine epidemic sweeping the city, and in part because of Sweet's increasingly divisive leadership due to his stance against the sale of crack on Grove territory. After giving Carl a reminder of just how bad things have gotten, you know, with their own mother having been killed as a result of the violence, the group starts to leave the cemetery, only to be ambushed by more balas who do a drive-by and blow up Smoke's car. And now, finally, the real first mission, and oh boy, what a doozy. So the goal here is really simple. Use a bike and make your way back to Grove Street by following Sweet and your other homies while avoiding the pursuing balas car. There are, however, a few problems. 
For one, Sweet and the rest of the homies are slow as hell, and trying to avoid being shot at by the Balas while they take their leisurely stroll back to Grove Street is a pain in the ass. Two, if you get too far away from Sweet, or later Ryder, when you're forced to split up from Sweet midway through the mission, you'll be told to go back and keep up with them, with the mission unable to proceed unless you're within a certain distance of either during each section. Three, the Balos car can be really, really aggressive, and you have no means of fighting back right now, so it can be very easy to get pinned against a wall or knocked off your bike by their car and die within seconds, since they're using submachine guns. Luckily, this time I made careful use of my rear view, took zigzaggy paths to keep pace with Sweet and then Ryder, and it looked like I might just make it back in one piece. Oh, Jesus. No, no, no. Oh, that was close. Uh, but at least we're already close to the end. Come on, CJ! You can't keep up with the fat man! Oh, would you shut the hell up, Big Smoke? So we make it back alive, and Sweet asks us when we plan on returning to Liberty City, but CJ says that he's actually thinking of sticking around, seeing how bad things have gotten in just the last five years. So we make it back alive, and Sweet asks us when we plan on returning to Liberty City, but CJ says that he's actually thinking of sticking around, seeing how bad things have gotten in just the last five years. Sweet gives him a bit more of a hard time, and then we are let loose once again, where we are introduced to the game's vehicle storage system, with the garage as his own safe houses, and the save game mechanic requiring us to enter our safe houses and activate the diskette icon, which is very appropriately 90s. This is where we get a proper look at how the interiors in this game work, and I mentioned this in my Vice City episode, but I definitely prefer that game system when it comes to interiors. Here, we enter an interior, and we go through these yellow triangles, and enter an entirely separate environment, completely separated from the larger overworld, if you will. In Vice City, you could still often see and hear the outside world from inside your safe house, and even shoot at people, but here, they're always completely separate, which I always thought was kind of a bummer. I mean, given the much larger scope of this game versus Vice City, and the fact that this was originally meant to run on a PS2, maybe this just makes sense from a resource distribution standpoint, but I don't know. Anyway, stepping outside, we receive our first phone call with Sweet explaining that in the last five years, at least two sets of Grove Street gangsters have split from the Grove and become their own separate gangs, the Seville Boulevard and Temple Drive families respectively, and reminds us that the Balas are everywhere and to watch our backs. So at least for now, when exploring on our own time, we'll have to be mindful of just whose territory we're in if we want to avoid unfair deaths. And I am going for a deathless, cheatless run, so we'll definitely be playing things safe a lot of the time. Uh, Future Gin is here, and I would just like to say that is what we like to call unintentional foreshadowing. Well, now it's time to check in on one of our homies for our next mission, but before we do, what the hell is this? Seriously, there's just a broken down car. A car that looks like it's basically been stripped down to nothing sitting in front of Ryder's house. The Rockstar team, like for every GTA, referenced both first-hand footage of the areas they were adapting from real-world LA, and historical footage to better match the era they were going for. So I have to assume that seeing something like this, right on somebody's lawn in a poor neighborhood of East LA in the 1990s, was at least somewhat common? Hell, maybe it still is. If you're an LA native, let me know if this is something you've seen often. So this mission is another tutorial of sorts, introducing us to some of the many new features that debuted in San Andreas. In this case, the ability to get haircuts and needing to eat food to stay alive, regain health, and needing to maintain weight along with it. Ryder gives us a bunch of crap and eventually we make our way to Old Reese's Barbershop to get a haircut. You know, this is something that never made a whole lot of sense to me as a real-world thing. I mean, in-game, sure, we can get a haircut and walk out of the barbershop with the best damn wigs we've ever seen, either that or this game's universe they've truly perfected hair regrowth formulas, but in the context of the real world, or even the game's world, since mechanics like the barbershop presumably work like the normal world outside of players' interactions with them, why does everyone say that CJ needs a haircut? I mean, the dude barely has any hair, and the only real cuts that you can get that make sense are just putting a fancy design into his short hair, but nobody else has anything like that. In fact, Ryder seems to have more hair than us, a lot of it actually, since presumably that's what's tied up on the back of his head in a bun. So we walk out of the barbershop feeling funky fresh, and then walk across the street to get some pizza, a full rack of course, and I find it hilarious that CJ literally just eats his food right at the counter. Ryder, however, had his own plans, and while we're finishing our meal, he walks up and tries to rob the place. At first it seems like Ryder's doing alright, and then the clerk pulls out a freaking shotgun. Oh shit, run! We hightail it out of there and jump back into Ryder's car, but before we speed away, I always kill the clerk here. It's not breaking my role-playing, since it makes perfect sense for them to kill somebody trying to kill them, but more importantly, this nets us an early shotgun. Very nice. Race back to the Grove, and it's time to get some sleep after a long night's, uh, work. 
Yeah, that was like a 3 a.m. pizza run, by the way. I wish they stayed open that late where I live. Sheesh. So I grab some guns that spawn on top of Sweet's house and over in the corner of the grove here just to be extra safe and start the next mission. This time for Sweet, tagging up turf, which is another tutorial, this time introducing us to the first of three new hidden package replacements, the graffiti tags. Yeah, so in the other 3D era GTA games, there are usually 100 hidden packages across the map. But, in San Andreas, there are instead separate collectibles for each city. 100 in Los Santos, 50 in San Fierro, and 50 in Las Venturas, on top of a buttload of other side activities, some of which we'll get to. For Los Santos, we have 100 locations spread across the map, mostly in gang territory with rival gang graffiti tags that we can spray over, and we can get rewards for collecting enough of them, in the form of weapons and armor that spawns inside the Johnson family home. I haven't decided if I'm going to be getting all of these. Like I said, I'm not going for 100%, but that being said, I am trying not to die even once, which isn't going to be easy, and having access to a lot of easy weapons would be very useful, so we'll see. So Sweet drops us off in Abala's neighborhood, and we spray two tags and then jump back into the car to drive to another location and spray more, with Sweet leaving us on our own this time as he goes to apparently spray tags elsewhere. I've done all 100 of these before. Sweet didn't do anything. He just drove around the corner while we did all the work. That work involves spraying a tag by this Cluckin' Bell where we get our first scripted encounter with some Balas on foot. Luckily for me, and unluckily for them though, I had that shotgun I picked up earlier, so... They weren't really an issue. But of course, the police showed up right after that, so I booked it over to the last tag. All we gotta do from there is climb some walls. Another new mechanic for the series at this point, believe it or not, and one which really opened up the ability to explore the game's cities. And then Sweet comes back, acting like the police are still on us or something, also taking the time to scoot his ass over and force us to drive home despite driving here himself in the cutscene. Anything to get in the carpool lane, huh, Sweet? We head home, and Sweet gives us a few bucks to go get some beers, so I cheekily decide to do just that. Heading over to the bar on Grove Street, I went inside, not to drink, but to do what a real gangster does at the local bar, play crappy 90s arcade games. That's what I do at the local bar. I have no idea why, but I played this game for like 8 minutes, and as far as I know, there is absolutely no reason to do this. I screwed up entering my initials on the high score screen though, because as any arcade player knows, there's only one thing to choose. ASS. But there's always next time. Grab some more weapons and save it one more time, and then it's on to the next one. So it's time to start the lengthy process of cleaning up the hood, with the mission, cleaning the hood. How appropriate. And after hearing more foreshadowing about later plot points and Sweet's argument with Big Smoke, we head on out with Ryder to find a pair of supposedly loyal Grove Street OGs who would be valuable assets in taking back the neighborhood. Arriving at B-Dup's house, we find he is now a high-level crack dealer, and the once very large Big Bear is now a skinny, weakened crackhead, and neither are interested in helping us rid the area of crack dealers, obviously. Look like it's up to us, then. Damn right it is. So we cruise on over to our first target and introduce ourselves. Hey, Bob, I'm working, man. What you need? What you need? And then make our way over to some of his friends in Bala's territory to storm a crack den. However, the game only expects me to have a baseball bat in this encounter, as the guns won't be properly tutorialized for another two missions. But since I do have several guns, these dealers go down real quick. CJ killed his first innocent civilian here by mistake when I accidentally auto-targeted this crackhead lady on the floor, but it seemed like a realistic thing that could actually happen in a situation like this, so I rolled with it, took out the rest of the aggressive dealers, but leaving these strung out people on the floor who are unarmed. Head back to the grove and that's one more down. After that, I decided to be even cheekier by grabbing some more armor underneath this bridge in Ganton, which I surprisingly only found out about from my chat during my 100% livestream of the game. I topped up my ammo for my two usual pickups, and then headed back to the next mission. That mission. drive through. Sweet and Big Smoke continue arguing, but Smoke casually avoids a bigger fight by suggesting we all go get some food. Some GTA Universe KFC. Chicken, man! No discussion! Man, I don't want no chicken! On the way to the restaurant, the group talks a little bit about the death of Beverly Johnson, with Ryder claiming that there are rumors that it was a green saber that rolled through the cul-de-sac that night, but Sweet remains reluctant to talk about it. They have sprayed the house. Me, the house. Shit. Then we get the cutscene, the big meme. Now, I'm sure lots of people have already pointed this out, but Big Smoke's order isn't nearly as massive as it seems. He's ordering for everyone in the car, so if you pay attention, he orders for CJ, Ryder, and Sweet, and then orders for himself a number 9 large, a number 7, two number 45s, one with cheese, and a large soda. Apparently, people have actually looked at the menus and figured out what each number is supposed to be, and what it amounts to is Smoke ordered for himself three burgers and a full bucket of chicken, but not like, you know, half the restaurant. Just in case you're dumb like me and that still hasn't clicked, because I feel like I only realized this a few years ago. 
Anyway, we get our food and Ryder notices a Bala's cart just before it opens fire on the car, and we have to chase it down before it gets back to Grove Street. Since I already had a bunch of SMG ammo at this point, which again, the game doesn't expect you to have, though it's really not that hard to get your hands on, I destroy their car pretty quick, and then clean up the Bala's as they try to flee. During the chaos, Big Smoke refuses to shoot back at the Bala's because he's too busy stuffing his big fat fucking face, but this couldn't possibly be more foreshadowing, right? We get back to the Grove and drop Ryder and Sweet off at his place, and then Big Smoke asks us to drive him home, since for some strange but not at all suspicious reason, he no longer lives on Grove Street, but down the road, in Bala's territory. Hmm... On our way home, Sweet nags us for being too skinny, too, and introduces us to another of San Andreas' more unique features. The ability to work out at gyms, build muscle, and learn special melee moves. None of this is mandatory for completing any missions, but I usually like to make CJ swole just because you can. But also, you can make a fat CJ just by eating food all the damn time if you feel like it. Plenty of fat gangsters, right? So we head back to the Grove and immediately jump into the next Sweet mission, which is when the game finally, properly introduces guns to us. We could have had plenty of encounters with guns, even if we hadn't found the ones around the Grove, but this is where we get our first explicit access to a sort of guns dealer, and get taught how to shoot, since San Andreas also had a substantially more complicated shooting system than either of the previous GTA games. Well, I say substantially, but the shooting is still very simple. The additions come in the form of a free aim mode on consoles and on PC, since the PC always had access to this option and the ability to do things like shoot car gas tanks to make them explode, as well as later getting access to the ability to dual wield certain weapons and strafe with assault rifles, among other perks. This is probably my favorite of the sort of RPG light elements that San Andreas introduced, though it isn't especially complicated. I'm pretty sure the only thing that dictates your skill with a weapon is how much you fired it, so if you really want to reach Hitman on something like the pistol or the Tech 9s this early, you could just fire the ammo a bunch or fire your gun wildly into the air. That's always a good idea, isn't it? So anyway, now we have the ability to go back to Emmett and get a single clip of 9mm ammo, even though there is literally one just behind Sweet's house that's easier to farm due to it being close to the same point, and there's a freaking Tech-9 on Sweet's roof, so I basically never have, and probably never will, go to Emmett for guns. You know, I feel like going to the gym. In the game, not in real life, obviously. I'm far too lazy and poor for that. So let's go and jump on our bike and... Oh, hell no. Who the hell does this guy think he is? Trying to rob a high-ranking Grove Street member in his own garage on Grove Street? No, sir. Don't care. I have roleplay justification. So then I went down to the gym to build some muscle and reached the point where I could learn the game's first set of new moves, which really just amount to unlocking new animations for the same attacks, since everything they teach me I already, you know, used to unlock the moves in the first place. Then I... Oh, what the hell? Someone stole my bike! No, my bike! Okay, not really. The game just despawned it, which isn't all that surprising, but this did annoy me quite a bit. I carjacked a station wagon and grabbed a slice of pizza at the well-stacked pizza company from earlier, who apparently didn't ban me after murdering one of their staff, and then I run into the love of my life. <laughs> the Saber. This is easily my favorite car across the entire GTA franchise, so naturally, after a passionate vehicular kiss confirming it was meant to be, I had to steal it. It's okay though, dude didn't even mind when I stole his car, he knew we were meant to be together. He wasn't going to stand in the way of destiny. Headed back to the Grove, stored the car and topped up on my ammo, and then headed over to Sweet's house to start the next mission. So Ryder goes all meta and gives us hell for apparently being a bad driver, even though so far I've done nothing but drive immaculately in missions. And then magically Big Smoke teleports here, and all four Grove OGs jump into Sweet's car to go perform a little drive-by of our own, as revenge for the attack on Beverly Johnson, and the more recent attack at the Cluckenbell. Now, this mission expects you to let the Grove boys do all the work, and in my experience, that can be very dangerous. Doable, sure, but dangerous. They can be a little bit finicky about shooting guys that are literally right in front of them, so I usually have a bunch of SMG ammo stocked up by this point to help deal with each group of baddies, and just let the others clean up the ones that I miss. This mission is also a great opportunity to pick up a bunch of extra ammo, but every single time I get out of the car to grab some, somebody in the car gives me crap and freaks out, thinking I'm about to pull another Flight of 87. Mow down three or four groups of balas near alleys and standing on street corners, and then kill a few more grouped together down at Glen Park, which will become a rather common location for gang fights, both mandatory and not so, and then we're all done. So, jumping right into the next sweet mission, we come to Sweet's Girl, a mission that more formally introduces us to just how bad things have gotten between the Grove and some of their former allies, who split off into their own sets, and Sweet's girlfriend, who was almost never heard from or mentioned again as far as I can remember. 
So we head to Sweets and nobody's home. But outside, we get a phone call from our bro saying he's pinned down with his new girl in Seville Boulevard family territory and needs a ride to escape. So we gotta get over there as quickly as possible. The timer on this mission is pretty generous though, so I have time to skip taking my shiny new saber since I know we'll need a four-door vehicle and instead jack this poor chap of a, well, a two-door vehicle. But I don't want to lose my saber. We get there and this mission can actually be a bit brutal if I remember right because of a bug related to aiming. I can't remember exactly how it works, but basically, sometimes the AI can get 100% accuracy in certain situations and just rip you apart the moment you're within range, and I'm pretty sure this is one of the missions where that can happen, but I don't remember what triggers it. It doesn't matter much though, since by keeping my distance and sticking to cover, I can take out all the enemies with relative ease. We pick Sweden and his girl up in presumably Sweet's car, though it could just be a coincidence that there was a greenwood here of a similar color. But then a group of Seville soldiers show up and a short chase ensues. It can be a bit intense, but I completely Chinatown Wars this one guy and evade the rest, arriving back at the Grove safe and sound, where Sweet assures us that he now has some unfinished business. Right. So after that, I went and bought a couple new pieces of clothing over at Binko and did my rounds at the gym, followed by plastering my body with tons of needless, arguably tasteless tattoos, because goddammit, it looks gangsta. And as I was leaving the tattoo parlor, I got into a fight with some ballas, which turned into a fight with the cops, which ended in my saber being on fire. Oh, god damn it. Ooh, look at that. Another one right there for the picking. Beautiful. After that, I headed back to the Grove to start our next sweep mission, which introduces one of the game's main supporting characters, who has thus far only been mentioned, Kendall's boyfriend, Cesar Vialpando. So, continuing the arguing we saw at the funeral before, Sweet continues to make it clear that he's a tad bit racist and that he prefers she not date a Mexican from a rival gang set. And then Kendall delivers a line that used to seriously confuse the hell out of me when I was a kid. I have no idea when it would have been, but I know that for a while I had no idea that Kendall was Sweet and Carl's sister, and I thought she was supposed to be Sweet's ex-girlfriend or something like that. Which I think just goes to show just how much Sweet was overstepping his boundaries trying to tell Kendall how to live. The thing that really confused me though was this line. I'm just trying to protect you. For what? So I can date one of your mindless friends? I don't think so. Now, the way this is set up, it looked to me like back in the day, mindless friends was a comment being directed at CJ, but I mean, I would have eventually figured it out even back then, since it's made more explicit just who Kendall is to Carl as well as Caesar later on down the line. So this mission is actually sort of another tutorial. I know, there's a lot of these. It introduces us to the ability to customize certain vehicles and do things like add custom paint jobs or even hydraulics, as well as shows us that one of the minigames we can play is a lowrider uh, bounce off down at Unity Station, where a lot of the Mexican gangs like to chill. We head down there and, oh crap, I spent all my money on tattoos, I can't afford to participate. Uh, give me all your money, I need it for a very, very important competition. Uh, Squabs, huh? Hey, watch this suit! Oh, mm. yeah, that's cute. Huh. Nobody inside the store where you need to buy things has any money to buy things. Interesting. Oh, I know. Roleplay, roleplay. Well, my headcanon is that I just beat these people senseless, not murdered them, so, you know, believe it. I ended up literally taking a train all the way downtown just so some peds would spawn, beat the crap out of this poor guy, took his cash, and then got right back on the train to get back to Unity Station and finally show these essays what's cracking. This minigame is really simple, it's basically slow man's DDR, just tap the right stick in the direction shown on screen, but it's super easy to beat the AI in this mission, even if the text at the top of the screen is frequently reminding me that I'm bad. Yeah, I know, thanks. The timing is just a little weird, but I also seem to remember this being a lot less of a problem back in the day on the original hardware, so who knows, maybe I suck now, maybe not. So next up, I tried to start a rider mission, but one of the game's more annoying mechanics reared its ugly head. Missions that can only be started at certain times. This isn't super annoying, but it is frustrating, and thankfully, it only took them another 9 years after this game to fix the problem when in GTA 5 missions just jump to the necessary time when starting them. For now though, lots of riders missions can only be done at specific times at night usually, so I decided instead to head on over to Big Smoke's house to be introduced to another infamous San Andreas character, Jeffrey, I mean OG Loke. We drive over to the Los Santos police station with Big Smoke and Swede and meet Loke, who is a wannabe gangster that grew up on Grove Street and has delusions of grandeur about becoming a world famous rapper. The literal first thing he wants to do out of prison is go and kill a man who supposedly stole his rhyme book, and he asks us for a gun and a ride to help him do it. 
Sweet initially makes it sound like we aren't going to take him seriously and just drive him home, but then we still drive over to East Los Santos where Carl decides to help Loke on his revenge mission for some reason, while Sweet and Smoke head back to the Grove. Alright, it's time to quickly address something about this mission that will, unfortunately, depressingly, cause some Grand Theft Auto fans to become very defensive. I love GTA games. I still play them, obviously, and I'm not boycotting them or any such nonsense, but sometimes some of their older jokes, and maybe even some of their newer ones, don't exactly land for me. And this is one example where I just flat out don't find it funny at all. And frankly, neither should you. Basically, and thanks to the wonderful YouTube overlords, I have to be coy and sidestep around flat out saying it here, but it's heavily implied that Loke was assaulted in a very private way, if you catch my drift. And this is played for laughs from both Sweet, Smoke, and CJ. Now don't get me wrong, Loke is a ridiculous character and it's often funny just how incompetent and delusional he is, but the ending of his introduction mission is some messed up shit that I don't think should be the subject of joking in any capacity. I'm gonna leave it at that. I'm not saying never play the game because Rockstar bad, at least not just because of this, but I'm not gonna sugarcoat things as anyone from my livestream knows. I gotta tell it like it is, or tell it like I see it anyway, or it just ain't real. Anyway, awkward segue back into something less serious. So anyway, we end up in a chase across Los Santos on a motorcycle, and this mission can be absolutely brutal. Freddy, the guy we're chasing, can be a real asshole, and he zigzags back and forth through alleyways and onto sidewalks, making this whole chase a bit of a tense experience. See, what happens a whole hell of a lot is that you fall off your bike while trying to keep up with Freddy's serpentine BS, and then you lose him and have to start it all over again. Amazingly though, I swear this almost never happens, I didn't fall off my bike once and even managed to kill Freddy using my own gun like halfway through the chase. Honestly, this went better than in almost every time I've ever done this mission before, as both the initial chase through the alleys is hard, and actually getting Loke to take down Freddy before reaching the scripted end is also pretty difficult. Normally, we end up at a basketball court in East Los Santos and have a shootout against Freddy and some of his Vagos buddies, but it's entirely possible to kill him before, at which point the game will play the cutscene at the basketball court as if we'd done the entire chase start to finish. Even weirder, though, is that after the game spawns me back at where I actually killed Freddy and... Wait... Where is OG Loke? What the hell? So yeah, this was weird, and it meant the conversation between CJ and Loke on the way back to Burger Shot was staggered and weird, only talking to each other when they were close enough until getting back into a car. Anyway, we drop Loke off at his new job as a hygiene technician down at Burger Shot, and then unlock another mission thread, doing missions for the wannabe gangster. But his missions are among my least favorite from this first section of the game, so we'll be leaving those until a little bit later. At this point, I decided to give CJ a new look because I wanted him to show off all those damn tattoos that I paid for that cost at least three people their lives. So I made him go shirtless and put on some greenish pants so he could still say he was flying the family colors. We also get a phone call from Caesar after completing his introductory mission, which unlocks his next mission, a street race. And if I remember right, completing that one unlocks the full-on racing circuit side mission for Los Santos. But in order to partake in the race, we need a lowrider. And according to Caesar, Nice ones. It gotta be nice. You don't get in, eh? So it's off to the mod shop to give my car a fresh new coat of paint in preparation for the race. It doesn't actually matter what your car looks like, obviously, as long as it's a lowrider, but I wanted to take this car, which is one of the few we're actually outright given and don't have to steal, and try to keep it for as long as possible, even though that didn't go so well for my last car. Anyway, we drive all the way over to the mod shop and... Ah, crap. <laughs> Oops, sorry, y'all. In a bit of a hurry here, so if you could all get out of my... Whoa. Whoa, 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 whoa! Wonderful. Just... Wonderful. Well, that went well, don't you think? Hey, isn't that the exact same car over there? So with my new second lowrider, I take it to the mod shop and use the scraps of money I have left to buy a nice flaming decal paint job, and then head on over to El Corona to start the next mission. This mission is stupid easy, it's just a point to point race and usually all the other racers will either bunch up and crash into each other, or just fall so far behind you that they'll never have any chance of catching up unless you're a really bad driver. Luckily for me, both of these things happen. Well, that was an easy thousand dollars. If only real life were like that. If the other racers are close enough to you as you cross the finish line, they can all pile up right at the end here too, which can be pretty funny, but like I said, I got so far ahead of them that when the mission completed, they all just despawned since they were so far away. Sad. After that, I decided to finally go and change the color of my saber by taking it all the way over to the mod shop on the west side of town. 
but on the way I almost lost my third car to random groups of ballas taking pot shots at me, such that by the time I finally did get to the mod shop, my car seriously needed the work. By complete coincidence, the Sabre is my favorite car and green is my favorite color, so we're going to unintentionally recreate the car that literally killed my mother, but hey, I never actually saw it happen, so as far as I'm concerned, it wasn't a green Sabre. By the way, how the hell have so many GTA fans still not seen the introduction? It's a 20 minute cutscene movie that sets up the events of San Andreas that was exclusive to the PC version. If you haven't seen it, go look it up, and even better, try to find the HD upscaled version since the original quality leaves a lot to be desired by today's standards. So anyway, I did a bit of cruising at this point and eventually made my way back to Grove Street and this time, I could actually start the next mission for Ryder now that the time of day was right. We walk up on him digging holes in his backyard. Why? Well, because he apparently buried stashes of PCP and is, as we nicotine slaves like to say, fiending real bad right now. He also mentions that he's got plans to rob somebody of some guns that would be real good for the Grove and he wants our help, so we're going to wait until it's dark out and then go do some breaking and entering. CJ and Ryder chill for the day, I guess, and eventually we walk outside to find a big-ass truck dropped off by Ryder's homie LB, who is almost certainly a reference to Leslie Benzies, one of the main personalities behind GTA's writing style. We take the truck and have to drive out to East Los Santos, where our target, a Vietnam War vet, with a ridiculous name, lives. Now this mission, playing it now as an adult and having done it so many times before, is easy, however. Back when I was a kid, for some reason, just making it to the colonel's house always took me way longer than it should have, since this was before the advent of handy-dandy GPS routes on your minimap, and I would always waste a ton of time trying to find the roads that connected to this long-ass Oceanside Expressway. I'm pretty sure I flat-out failed this mission a few times because I didn't get to his house on time, but these days, I know Los Santos pretty well and have no trouble making it there with plenty of time to spare, which will actually be quite useful. See, this mission is, as I mentioned, a B&E, and our goal is to quietly walk through this guy's house, grab at least three crates of guns, and load them onto our truck. But you're able to get up to like six or seven, I think, if you have enough time and use it efficiently. So over the course of the next few minutes, I completely clean this place out, and unfortunately, that also means we don't get the cutscene of him having like PTSD dreams of Charlie's on the tree line, and instead make our way out nice and smooth without ever alerting him. Getting all the crates also skips a little bit of dialogue between CJ and Ryder right before getting into the truck, which I never noticed before. And then on the way back to stash the goods, we get another glimpse at the tension that exists between the two. Ryder seems to hold some contempt for CJ for leaving in 87, as well as some jealousy or envy that he was so quickly accepted back into the fold after being gone for five years, when he's been around the whole time putting in work. This exchange, along with a few others, are why I don't really believe the popular fan idea that Ryder was never meant to betray CJ alongside Big Smoke, or at the very least, why I don't think he was meant to be a hero, so to speak, as there are some other good reasons to believe that he wasn't meant to originally be working with Smoke. I like to think that Ryder would have died in the fight towards the end of the first section of the game, and that the tension that existed between him and CJ could have served as a source of guilt for Carl, as well as additional motivation to take down Smoke. Ooh, I guess I'm getting into spoiler territory, but I mean, I expect the vast, vast majority of you already know what's going to happen. Anyway, with this mission complete, we also unlock the robbery minigame, which I literally never understood how to do properly until my chat helped me figure it out when I streamed this game last year. Basically, there's a van. A very specific van in each of the game's three cities. And if you find and enter that van after like 8pm or something, you can start a minigame that functions just like the mission Home Invasion, but with some additional freedom. There are actually a ton of interiors that you can access too, which honestly blew me away when I first saw them last year, since, as a kid, a number of things prevented me from doing this minigame at all. For one, I used to think it could be any van like this one, and would therefore almost never be able to actually start the minigame, since in actuality, it has to be one very specific van in each city. Second, when I did find the right van at the right time and managed to start the minigame, for whatever reason I could never find any houses to enter. I know now where most of the places you can rob are, and there are quite a few, but somehow, back then, I could never find any, and I gave up on it years ago until finally learning how it works, and now, well, I consider it a very welcome addition, even if mechanically it's very simple, and honestly, very broken. See, what you can do is find a street like this one here, where there are multiple houses nearby, but really, you only need to find two robbable entrances close to each other, and then park your truck in such a way that you'll have easy access to the back as you exit each house. Then you just walk in, sneak, which I learned after Home Invasion lets you just walk at full speed as long as you stay crouched, grab an item to steal like a TV, radio, or video game console, and then run for the door. And you don't even need to sneak when you rob small houses like this since moving fast just starts a 10 second timer and it stops as soon as you exit the building. 
Then you can just move on to the second house, and once you do the same thing there, return to the first one, and magically all the items you stole will have respawned. Rinse, repeat for the whole night, and you can easily complete this side mission in one go, and make some pretty good money too. Very nice. Well, with my new riches, I decided to take my motherfucking green saber and go install some nitro on it for fun. And then come back and customize my lowrider for... Oh, what the hell? Did you steal your license? Oh, you want to go, eh? Alright, alright. Listen, buddy. Let me put this politely. Yeah, that's what I thought. You know, maybe I was a bit harsh on him. I wonder if he... Oh. Oh, jeez. Uh, not my fault. Hell yeah, now I'm rolling in style. I also got a few more tattoos and a new shirt. Alright, on to the next mission. Our next mission for Ryder continues the established theme of robberies, but this time it's a bit different. We walk in on Ryder cooking PCP at his stove indoors, which, as CJ points out, cannot be a good idea, but we're interrupted by our favorite police officers, Tenpenny and Pulaski. Oh, and Hernandez is there too, in the background being quiet. Oh, the bitch! So, Tenpenny continues playing both sides, since his ultimate goal is to maintain the state of war between the Grove and the Balas for his benefit, and he tells us of a train arriving soon that will have a... Little something something on board for you, boy. Square business, man. So off we go to intercept a train, which I guess I haven't mentioned yet. Yeah, so there are trains in this game, but we'll get to a much more infamous train later on. So we drive on over to the tunnel and find the train stopped and already being fought over by Vagos. And shortly after, a bunch of Balas show up too, so it looks like Grove Street wasn't the only gang that he told about the incoming shipment. We deal with the enemies nice and quick and then have to jump into the back of the train and play a short minigame tossing crates from the back into Ryder's hands as he tries to follow us. This part used to seriously piss me off. In fact, I'm realizing now that all of the Ryder missions used to give me quite a bit of trouble when I was younger. And for this one, it was this part. I've since learned the best way to do this is just aim for Ryder or just above the hood of the car, and you can get it done with minimal effort. But as I say so often, and will again, back then, it was a whole hell of a lot harder. We also have to escape a pretty hefty wanted level 2 once we get enough crates. And for some reason we have to drive again, even though another Grove guy was driving two seconds ago, but they place us so close to the pan spray that it's really not that difficult to make it there without getting busted. Then all we gotta do is drive back to Ryder's and mission complete. And since this next mission is the last one for Ryder in the entire game, I decided to jump right into it after a quick save and an outfit change after Catalyst. And it just so happened to be like 3am when I started the mission, which for some reason made it even funnier to me that Ryder was sitting in his backyard in the middle of the night, high as a kite, listening to some classic music. Anyway, he tells us our next target is the freaking army, or the National Guard anyway, who are guarding a shipment of weapons down at the ocean docks. Using another mysterious van that appears in front of Ryder's house, we drive on over and have to jump the fence to shoot out the controls and let Ryder park the truck right in front of the warehouse. Then comes my favorite part of every Ryder mission, the annoying part. What we gotta do is drive this forklift and collect a total of six crates, four inside and two outside, and do it quickly enough that Ryder doesn't literally die to the like one or two soldiers who spawn out here with nothing but 9mm pistols. Actually, you can just get out and shoot them yourself since Ryder is a terrible shot, meaning you effectively have infinite time here, but what makes this part annoying is just the forklift controls. It's not the worst, it's certainly not that one mission from Vice City Stories, and I even managed to clean out the warehouse nice and easy, but those last two crates proved far more challenging to get loaded for some reason than they really should have, thanks to the wonkiness of the game's physics and my poor driving skills. With all six crates loaded though, we can make our escape, and here we can honk our horn to have Ryder throw one of the crates from the back, which will explode upon impact with the pursuing soldiers, but I don't think there's a limit to how many we can throw even though we only have six. These guys can be super aggressive, but as long as you keep an eye behind you and you don't tip the truck over, you can make it back to the lockup, which for some reason is at Emmett's this time and not LB's. Weird. After that craziness, CJ vows to not work with Ryder anymore until he stops smoking PCP, and since, well, that's never gonna happen, this ends the Ryder mission thread, though he will be seen a few more times in the first section of the game during other missions. Alright, let's get back to Grove Street. No, crap, listen, it was an accident. I didn't do it. I wasn't even in town that weekend. Can we just... You know what? Screw y'all, I'm hiding on the... Roof. Whew. Okay, y'all, leave me alone. This is uh, starting to feel personal. Nah, screw it again, I'm going for it. Whoa. Whoa! Oh, this is going so wrong so fast. Sir? Sir, I need to borrow your vehicle. If you could just let me... Okay, now I just gotta get the hell out of... Oh, god damn it. So yeah, I got busted. What of it? I don't count this as a death since... 
I mean, it's not, but it does still suck. Since I'm going for a deathless run, not an arrest-free run, though, I just gotta deal with it. I lose my guns and armor, but luckily I've been getting most of my guns for free anyway, so I can just head back to the grove and do a bit of farming on Ganton's special crop. Once I got myself strapped, I head over to see our good buddy Big Smoke for our first, well, technically second mission for his thread, but the first one that's centered around him mostly. We walk up to Smoke's house and totally not suspiciously crash or just on their way out, but Smoke insists he doesn't tell them anything, because for him, it's all about his homeboy Carl. For me, it's all about my homeboy Carl. Yeah, whatever you say. So we gotta help Smoke pick up his cousin who's coming in from Mexico, and we learn pretty quickly that in fact what he meant was pick up a shipment of weed being brought in by some Eastside Vagos that he intends to steal. At least I think that's what's going on here. We get an amusing cutscene where Smoke provokes some Vago stealers and then attacks one of them with a baseball bat, and then we have to chase down the second one on foot past a couple of attacking gangsters to presumably get his stash, but honestly, I don't actually know. We kill him and the mission ends, but we never pick up a package or anything, and I don't even see Big Smoke again, so maybe the point of this was actually just to take out the Vago stealers, but again, I'm not entirely sure. Anyway, change of clothes and it's right into the next Big Smoke mission. That one. Alright, hot take. I don't actually have all that much trouble with this mission these days. Now, to be fair, I definitely remember having plenty of trouble with it back in the day, but that's true of many missions throughout the franchise, and for many of them, it's still true. Wrong Side of the Tracks, however, almost never trips me up anymore, and if it does, it never takes me a ridiculous amount of tries to complete like some other ones do, so I'm not entirely sure why so many people seem to still struggle with it. I mean, again, we're remembering, a lot of us, how hard it was back then when we were kids, and the infamous meme which arose from failing this mission. All we had to do was- But, also keep in mind that I'm generally pretty terrible at video games, so if I can do it, so can you. This has been a motivational PSA with Guinness Walker. So the actual mission involves crashing another Vago's drug deal of sorts, taking place above the tunnel at Unity Station. Well, we get seen pretty quickly and the gangsters we're chasing jump onto a moving train, forcing us to pursue them on a bike. The goal here is to drive alongside the train and give Big Smoke enough time to shoot down all four Vago's gangsters, and along the way there will be obstacles like cars on the tracks that explode when struck by the train, and several oncoming trains which we'll have to skillfully dodge. The secret I've found is to simply stick to the far side of the opposite train track and do your best to keep up with the cab while avoiding the obstacles. If you do this correctly, Smoke should have plenty of time and distance to start shooting, since if you're too close or too far, he won't even shoot, let alone hit them. The other big thing to avoid is this side path that the game encourages you to take once you exit the first tunnel. This path is probably the reason so many of us have and still do struggle to complete this, because if you take that path, you've already lost. Nowhere along the rest of the route it takes you on does Big Smoke have the right angle to shoot the bad guys, and by the time you do get back on the track and he can shoot again, you'll likely have wasted too much time and get that most infamous of mission failed scenes. Follow the damn train, CJ! But, just stick to the actual train track, avoid the second oncoming train, and stick with the cab, and you should be able to, like I did, finish this mission before even exiting the second tunnel. In fact, I got it on the first try, not bragging or anything. And now for the final Big Smoke mission, which is one that I honestly remember having almost as much trouble with as Wrong Side of the Tracks back in the day. We meet up with Smoke and head out to another deal, of course, but this time it's apparently with some Russian gangsters, and Big Smoke makes it pretty clear that things could get heavy. And then two seconds later they do. We're forced into our first really big gunfight in this atrium, but it's nothing too difficult, and we can grab armor refills while we're here. We shoot a few more dudes outside, but then the real mission begins, this on-rails shooter section where Big Smoke drives the motorcycle, and we have to shoot at Russians chasing us across the city. This whole sequence gets pretty intense, with references to several action movies, including, most notably, Terminator 2, with the emergence of this car carrier truck, which can't actually be destroyed, so save your bullets for the bikers. In fact, the bikers are the main things to concern yourself with for this whole mission, as they have two people both capable of shooting with their SMGs, while the cars only have one the guy riding shotgun. I have failed this mission before for sure, but it's another one that rarely gives me much trouble these days, though it does seem like I always cut it a little bit close given how much health we have as we finish the mission. It may also be worth mentioning at this point that most of the time I am playing with a PS4 controller and using a mod that does give me a slight advantage by giving me basically GTA 4 style driving with precision control over my acceleration and deceleration. In this, though, I switch to my mouse and keyboard, or really just my mouse, since being precise here is very helpful, and this may be another reason the mission used to drive me so crazy back in the day, relying on the significantly less precise aim of a control stick. Anyway, we make it through this gauntlet, and Welcome to the Jungle even starts to play, but for some odd reason gets cut out during the epic leap, which seems like a missed opportunity, 
and then we take out the rest of the pursuing bikers and wrap up the mission by splitting ways in an alley on the east side. And with that, we have completed yet another mission thread, and we can now move on to perhaps my least favorite thread of this section, the OG Loke missions. Hooray. So, this whole mission thread is one of the most confusing and strange in the game. Okay, well, maybe not strange, but here's the thing. Nobody, and I mean nobody, seems to actually like OG Loke. Nobody treats him with any respect, and nobody wants him around, but for some reason, CJ is willing to steal whatever Loke asks him to in pursuit of helping his rap career, while making fun of him and showing contempt for him like everybody else. Now, I'm not saying Loke isn't worthy of contempt, he is very intentionally annoying, but it never feels like the game reasonably establishes a motivation for CJ to help Loke, beyond him being a childhood friend, I guess? Now, maybe it's because gangsters like CJ want to be able to say they were there for their homies, even if they didn't actually like them, but I don't know, this entire thing is the first major story fumble for the game in my opinion, and trust me, it gets worse very soon. Now, for our first mission, all we gotta do is head down to the beach and steal a sound system for Loke's planned record release party. And what that entails is playing another timed DDR-style minigame, where we gotta hit the buttons on screen to score enough points to be led inside the sound van. Now, this isn't very difficult. I ended up completing it with like 1,500 more points than I needed, but something to do with the PC port or something makes the buttons on screen act all funky, and they definitely do not sync to the beat of the music, which makes the whole thing a tad frustrating. Once we do score enough points, the lady lets us into the van, and we immediately drive off to deliver it to a lockup for Loke. Now, some party dudes are supposed to chase you here, if I remember right, but at least this time I was completely tail-free the whole way back, so... I'm not exactly sure what happened to them, especially considering how much I fumbled getting off the beach. Now, this is the mission that truly breaks the story so far, or at least severely confuses or undermines the motivations of our main protagonist here. Loke asks us to steal the rhyme book of a famous Los Santos rapper, Mad Dog, which in my estimation would be like being asked to steal Dr. Dre or Biggie's rhyme book at the height of their careers. In other words, it would probably be suicide. And yet CJ agrees, with barely any prodding from Loke, too. Anything to get him to stop rapping, I guess. So we head all the way over to this mansion in the Vinewood Hills, and begin one of the game's few stealth sections, thankfully. The stealth mechanic in this game is super underutilized and underdeveloped, and it feels like it was completely unnecessary. But something new that I noticed while playing this mission, having only recently finally played the first Manhunt game, is that this mission in some way may have served as an inspiration, gameplay-wise, for the Manhunt series, or maybe vice versa. I mean, from the way shadows keep you hidden, to raising your arm just before killing a soldier, to the heavy breathing that plays when hiding, it's very clear to me that this mission served as some sort of basis for the Manhunt formula, or that the Manhunt formula was used as the basis for it, and just expanded upon thoroughly. And perhaps that explains why I don't like it very much. Now, viewers of my stream probably know this, but I am not a huge Manhunt fan. I played the game for a Criminal History episode, and while there are things that I enjoyed about it, overall it was definitely not the type of game that I would pick up on my own time. And the only reason I did was because of its connection to the 3D era of GTA, taking place in the same universe in the fictional Carcer City. Well anyway, we have to sneak our way through the mansion, but really we can go loud whenever we want to if we can handle the guards, and eventually we find the rhyme book in the studio near the other entrance, which begs the question, why didn't we come through the other side? Once we grab it, the game encourages us to just run and gun our way out if we want to, so we do that after failing to stay hidden when executing this fella right here. I actually took some pretty decent damage here and came as close as I have so far to dying, but I did manage to survive and jumped on the bike just outside to rush back to OG Loke. Paranoid that somewhere along the way I would crash and die in embarrassing fashion. Surprisingly, that didn't happen, so we're able to wrap up one of the more potentially annoying missions in the game in one try with minimal headache. Well, that was a job well done, and I'm sure the implications of that mission won't come back to create plot holes or missing character arcs or anything like that, so let's head back to the Grove and... Oh, hold on. What up? Don't try hitting me up with that ghetto babble boy. Ah, shit. Here we go again. So, it's time for our first official errand for Crash, though we've seen them here and there already playing all sides in the city's gang wars, but now it's time to begin following up on the actual reason they framed Carl for murder in the first place, covering up their own crime. So we meet up with Tenpenny, Pulaski, and Hernandez at the donut place in Market, and are given the task of killing another gangster who has apparently gotten on Tenpenny's bad side. But more than just kill him, Tenpenny wants us to send a bit of a message. Now this mission never elaborates on who it is exactly we're targeting, but as you'll see later with additional crash missions, almost everything with them ties back to keeping their names clean, which is exactly why they blackmail Carl to begin with. So, knowing that, I have to assume whoever we're killing here, it's because they're threatening to expose some of Crash's dirty little secrets. 
In order to properly send the message that they are not to be trifled with, he wants us to retrieve some Molotov cocktails and literally set the entire apartment building on fire, which will obviously kill more than just our target, so we run over, grab them, but you might notice I made a silly mistake when doing this mission. I brought my personal car with me. See, in most missions in early GTA games and even GTA 4, bringing the car that you're considering yours with you on a mission is a death sentence for that automobile. Either the game will spawn a different car it wants you to drive, or just flat out despawn your car because it was in the way, or for literally no reason whatsoever. The point is, 99% of the time it's not a good idea to bring your car with you. But I remembered how this mission worked, and I thought, maybe I'd be able to hold on to my saber if I played my cards right. So, off I went to grab the Molotovs, fill up on some armor and ammo, just in case, and then headed over to the apartment complex. Now... I knew I had a real chance of dying for the first time here since, as the game warns you, throwing the Molotovs too short can result in you being caught in their blast, and the fire damage can be absolutely devastating, even with armor, so I was going to have to be careful and deliberate with each throw. Luckily, I also already knew that a couple of Vagos will try to ambush you around the corner after throwing the first couple Molotovs, so I dealt with them and amazingly didn't hit myself even once with the fire, which I honestly don't think I've ever done before. Then comes another strange, seemingly unfinished feature of the game that seems a little bit shoehorned in here, both mechanically and story-wise. CJ notices a woman trapped inside the burning building and decides now, over all other instances, to run in and risk his life to save her. Now, even ignoring all the possible innocent people he kills on a daily basis just driving from one place to another, this doesn't exactly seem in character for CJ. I mean, for one thing, odds are she wasn't the literal only woman in the building, so the fact that CJ was willing to do this at all, but then runs in last minute to save this woman is already a bit confusing. And then there's the woman he stole from and possibly killed two missions ago, even if you're going to argue he had a soft spot because she's a woman, that still doesn't make a whole lot of sense. The real reason this section exists is to introduce another new mechanic, but actually, before we get to that one, we have another one just inside the building. Fire extinguishing. Now, I'm not sure who thought this was why people played GTA, to put out fires, but this whole system of being able to put out fires is only ever used in like two, maybe three missions. It's tedious and completely unnecessary if you ask me. We run through the building, stand in front of a wall of flames a few times and just hold the fire button, ironic, find the girl and then deal with her terrible AI pathing to get back to the bottom floor exit and leave the building. After saving her life, we give her a ride home and learn that her name is Denise, and she just so happens to live just off of Grove Street, right around the corner from us, and she's already familiar with Carl's reputation being the brother of the gang's leader. So, dropping her off, Denise becomes our girlfriend, and we can now pick her up for dates whenever we want, which will eventually unlock a unique outfit and usually a vehicle. See, beyond Denise, there are a number of potential girlfriends throughout the game, but only one other girl you meet through the actual story. And since none of them actually have anything interesting scripted to say with CJ, there is literally no point to doing these unless you need the outfit or vehicle or special benefit they each provide, locked behind each specific one. I really don't care for this system as it's just not fleshed out enough and it feels subsequently a bit out of place, but the idea here is a good one, which would go on to be dramatically improved for GTA 4 and later 5, sort of. For this game, though, I am going to be mostly ignoring the girlfriends, except for two, since on top of a vehicle or outfit, they also provide special bonuses, like I said, based on their jobs. And there is both a cop and paramedic we can date later, who will let us keep our weapons upon dying or being arrested, just in case. Well, I was planning to do some more driving around after that, but immediately upon finishing Burning Desire and driving home to save, I got the call from Sweet to begin the mission Doberman. Now, I could be remembering wrong, or it could be one of my mods, but I could swear I remember this mission auto-starting upon receiving the phone call, but this time I was instead given the sweet mission marker over at Ammunition. Whether or not I'm creating false memories, it's time to head over and finally unlock the ability to purchase guns, instead of relying solely on the pickups near the Grove. This mission, kinda, sorta, has a bit of a story, but really, it's just another tutorial for another new mechanic. This time, Gang Territories. Spread around Los Santos are territories controlled by the three main gangs the Vagos, the Balas, and our gang, Grove Street Families. After completing this mission, we'll be able to take over neighborhoods throughout the city. But there is a major problem with this mechanic that we'll talk about at the end of this first section, so for now, we're only going to do what the game demands of us, and not a fraction more. Here, we have to take over the neighborhood Glen Park, and the way gang wars work is you have to first find a group of at least three enemy gangsters, and then kill them all on foot to trigger the first of three waves. Then you'll be assaulted by several groups of enemies whose weapons will gradually upgrade as you take more territory, and once you've killed everyone in the third wave, the neighborhood is yours. Your held neighborhoods can also be attacked at any given moment, and if you ignore them, they fall to the attacking gang, so 
That's also something you'll need to worry about, though. Really, not until the end of the game. Oh, we also have to kill some random Bala gangster here who runs out of the building after taking the territory, shouting that Tenpenny set him up. So, I think that's the game attempting to tie this back to the story, but it's never elaborated on. Anyway, now that we've done that, we can... Oh, for the love of... My car's gone. I had actually managed to hold on to it throughout Burning Desire like I'd hoped, but then I got greedy and brought it for this mission too, and now it's gone. I mean, it is called Grand Theft Auto. So after crying over the loss of my car, again, I decided to jump right into the next mission and the final crash mission for this section of the game, and one of the game's harder missions up to this point, Grey Imports. Now, I seriously doubt any of you can find it, but my very first YouTube video ever, which would have been on an account whose name I don't even remember, used this name. It was some ridiculous slideshow of stick figures telling a story that I can't even remember, and I would have probably been like 11 or 12 when I made it, but the point is, apparently this mission left an impression on me even all the way back then. We meet up with Crash again at the donut shop, and Tenpenny tells us that he's going to help Grove Street by telling us about an arms deal going down between the Balas and the Russian Mafia, down at the Docklands, which threatens to destabilize the established dynamic between the Grove and the Balas, and give the Balas, as Tenpenny sees it, an unfair advantage. So out of the kindness of his heart, he tells us where to find them, and then Carl, on his own accord, heads over to do exactly what Tenpenny wants him to do, even if this time he's not actually being blackmailed to get it done. Explicitly, anyway. So this compound is full of enemies packing SMGs, which are the third tier and highest damaging submachine guns in the game. Appropriate name, then. So we'll have to be careful about getting too close too soon. There are also at least two guys driving forklifts in this first area who will charge at you, and on the front of them are explosive barrels, so you definitely want to deal with these guys from afar, and quickly if possible. The second one actually ended up kinda getting stuck, and I had to play a bit of Toro Toro with him until I had set him on fire, but I also learned something new about the fire system in this game, Rain does not affect it. I mean, it seems kind of obvious, but it started raining just after this large fire broke out close to the warehouse door, and I guess I've been playing too much, like, Breath of the Wild or something, because I expected it to almost instantly fizzle out, but it just kept on burning. Anyway, shoot out the door controls, and then we begin the second section of this mission, the tight corridor shootout between the boxes, with several scripted NPCs who will try to jump out and ambush you. There are also explosive barrels scattered around here you gotta watch out for, but if you use them to your advantage and just take it slow through here, you should be just fine. At the end we got a bigger room with a few more enemies, but at the top of the stairs is our real target, the Russian mobster in charge of this deal, who we are then expected to chase out of the building while dealing with these surrounded foot soldiers. Now it is possible to actually kill this guy before he reaches the car he's running for, but in a normal playthrough, first time, you'd probably get distracted fighting the guards, which will mean that you'll need to chase him down on a motorbike to complete the mission. However, if you instead ignore the guards and just put as many bullets in him as possible, you can just barely kill him before he reaches the car and instantly pass the mission, and conveniently despawn all the guards attacking you. Nice. Oh, and to make up for my saber disappearing, I took his banshee and gave it the Guinness Walker treatment, green and white, and then added some nitro just for good measure. Oh, and also by this point I had also given up on role-playing since I'd accidentally run over numerous pedestrians and caused a bunch of chaos even while not trying to since, you know, it's Grand Theft Auto. So next up is the single most damning mission when discussing any potential for our protagonist CJ here to be morally gray, or at least relatable in his actions helping his friends and family. Management issues. See, we stop by OG Loke and he tells us that since stealing Mad Dog's rhymes and ripping off his lyrics, Dog's manager has made it his personal mission to blackmail Loke and make it impossible for him to make it in the entertainment industry, and so far, it's working. So. To fix this problem, Loke asks us to literally murder him, and though CJ is reluctant at first to agree to it, he takes literally no convincing to actually carry it out, and what's more, he even seems to enjoy the act, as we'll see in just a bit, which just makes Carl look like an outright monster in this mission. So we gotta intercept one of the manager's chauffeurs before they head out to pick him up. So we have about four in-game hours to bring my car back home, since before remembering which mission this was, I thought I could maybe use it again, and then something interesting happened. By wasting time bringing my car back, I got a phone call while driving from OG Loke telling me that the chauffeur just left Burger Shot, and honestly, I don't think I'd ever heard this before in my life since I normally head right over there and thus make it redundant. Luckily, I was quick enough to still make it to the chauffeur before 10, and instead of having to damage his car like the game tells me and then bring it to the pay and spray nearby to fix it, I just carjack him when conveniently catching him at a red light, and learn that for whatever reason, doing this doesn't provoke the cop who was literally right next to me when I did it. Then we just gotta drive over to the other chauffeurs and follow the convoy to the premiere, where we pick up both the manager and his girlfriend, wife, whatever, and here is where things get messed up. 
Carl taunts the two of them, and then we drive off to the nearby pier, where we're going to leap out of the car last minute and let them both die by drowning in the car. The manager even says that he can't swim, making this an even more sadistic way of killing him, and that's not even mentioning the girlfriend. I mean, did Carl not go out of his way and risk his life two or three missions ago to save an innocent woman, and now he's just fine with murdering another one and even taunting her and her boyfriend before murdering them in cold blood? And the whole time before jumping from the car, she's screaming her head off? Seriously, this mission alone should basically eliminate any sympathy for CJ when discussing him being a good person, which amazingly, people still do, and for me, it's just another example of San Andreas' occasionally sloppy writing, since in most other scenes, this isn't the type of person we're led to believe that Carl is, yet somehow, this mission still made it into the final game, so... It is also worth noting that CJ does all of this cold-blooded murder without getting paid, and for somebody he doesn't even seem to like or respect at all, and it makes literally no sense. And even worse, none of this will ever be reflected on or even brought up again, which just adds insult to injury. So the next time you're eager to leave a comment on one of my videos about how actually Sweet was the worst, remember that no matter how annoying Sweet was, he never did some messed up crap like this. CJ did, for whatever reason. Alright, well now it's time to wrap up the OG Loke mission thread with the mission House Party, in which Loke quits his lucrative career as a hygiene technician at Burger Shot, and aims to have a big party to celebrate before he goes back to the joint. I know I mentioned earlier that it's supposed to be a record release party, but I guess I just remembered wrong, even though I could swear that the party was referenced all the way back in the first Loke mission, Life's a Beach, when we stole the sound van. So all we gotta do for this mission is head back to Grove Street in my fancy new green banshee... <sighs> I gotta stop doing this to myself. So all we gotta do is head back to the Grove in this random car I stole after getting a fancy new haircut, and also throw on some clothes at Binko on the way to fully trigger the mission. Hey, Lo. This party is jumping. We got a gang of crazy ass bitches in the house. You coming over, homie? Uh, I don't know, man. I have some plans tonight. But we had a big disaster. I won't be rapping. I'm mic broken. Ah, uh, okay. I'm gonna come over right now, then. Well, that's all the reason I need to actually attend this party, so let's go. Once again, this mission demonstrates that while people like CJ show Loke some respect to his face, when he can't be heard and to his actual friends, Carl and the others have absolutely no love for Loke which once again makes me wonder why anyone goes to his party in the first place. So anyway, midway through the bash, we step outside to chill with our homies, and one of our boys runs over to warn us that a Bala's posse is just about to roll up on the group, giving us just enough time to make a road blockage and prepare for the assault. Then what we gotta do is survive a bit of an onslaught from the Bala's coming from all directions, but as long as you got plenty of ammo and some armor starting off, this mission isn't too bad. I also unintentionally kill a few of our own because they won't stop standing in the way, but hey, What's well, a little friendly fire between homies, right? With that done, we won't have to see or hear from OG Loke for quite a while, so that's good. Well, actually, we will be able to hear him a couple of times on the radio before we see him next, but not his music. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Now all we have left for this first Los Santos section of the game is a handful of sweet missions that start to ramp up the difficulty as we approach the end of Act 1, as it were. So our first of the three final missions in Los Santos is Los Sepulchros. Los lo Sepulchros? Lo Los Sepulchros. Where we're going to attack a Bala's funeral, just like they attacked Beverly's at the start of the game. Thanks to some info from the always meddling Tenpenny, Sweet learns of a funeral being held for some of the Balas that we killed in a previous unspecified mission, and it will be a perfect opportunity to take out a bunch of high-ranking Balas at once, with our primary target being a front yard lieutenant, Kane. Warm it up, CJ. Warm it up, Kane. This mission also introduces us to another new feature that has actually been available to us, but hasn't been formally introduced to us. The gang system. In addition to being able to conduct gang warfare across Los Santos, we can also recruit our own gangsters who will follow us and help us fight the Balas if we want, or just shoot back at the cops if we want some in our car. But, this is another mechanic the game introduces that sees very little use in the main missions, and is practically useless outside of them. We're forced to recruit at least two guys here though, and in fact Sweet's car won't even move until they get in, so the game wants to make sure we bring them with us, and we'll continue to act like they're there even if they aren't later on. We head over to the eponymous graveyard where we started the game, the first proper mission, and after another brief mission tutorial explaining the ability to disband or call back the gangsters following us, it's on. Kane here is basically like a boss, and like Sweet says, he's wearing body armor, meaning he takes considerably more ammo to drop than the rest of his cronies. Luckily, this mission, while rather intense in concept, isn't too bad if you use the graves and whatnot as proper cover, and focus on killing the grunts first to avoid cheap deaths before taking down Kane himself. 
Once we drop him, we gotta hop into a new car for some reason, even though Sweet's car is undamaged and right where we left it, and then get back to the Grove without getting busted. Very conveniently though, there's a pay and spray right around the corner, so it really just ends up being another drive across town without any harassment from NPCs, and with that done, we have just two more sweet missions to go before wrapping up the first section of the game. Alright, time for the penultimate mission for Los Santos this time around, reuniting the families. So even though it hasn't really been built up to us by showing us, say, interactions between Sweet Smoke and other former Grove Street sets, Somehow, by this point, Sweet has managed to set up a meeting between himself and the heads of the Seville Boulevard families and Temple Drive families at the Jefferson Motel, where they're going to try and bring all three sets back under one umbrella to unite against the Balas and their endorsement of crack cocaine. We head off with the four OGs, Sweet, Smoke, and Ryder, and along the way we get a bit more bitterness from Ryder before we get to the motel, and Sweet heads off to meet with the other family heads. Pretty quickly, though, all hell breaks loose as a SWAT division of the LSPD shows up to crash the party. And as chaos begins to break out, Smoke and Ryder bail, leaving us to head inside the motel and rescue Sweet on our own. Now inside here, there are lots and lots of SWAT guys who will try to ambush you and catch you off guard. And since most of them are carrying at least SMGs, they can seriously ruin your day if you're not careful. This mission also really begins to show the direction that Rockstar would eventually go for later games like GTA V though, since all the encounters with the SWAT inside the building are heavily scripted, and thus pretty easily avoided or dealt with if you know they're coming. We push our way through one hallway at a time and eventually find Sweet, at which point we can cut to escaping onto the roof and get ambushed by an LSPD chopper loaded with SWAT dudes all carrying SMGs. Use the considerable amount of SMG ammo that I've picked up for myself so far, and then head out down along the side of the building with Sweet to start the next section, which is unfortunately another on-rails shooter section, much like Just Business. Now this one is much harder to actually fail in my experience than just business, but nonetheless, it can be very chaotic and a bit clutch if your aim isn't the best, so once again, I switched to aiming with the mouse for this part to lessen my chances of dying. We pass through several phases of the chase with scripted cop cars showing up every so often, and even a couple of police bikers who try to leap onto the hood of the car, but eventually we hit a roadblock, and the AK-47 we're using, which apparently Ryder got from Emmett, jams. Fantastic. When we take a hard right turn, we run into another chopper right in our path too, but Big Smoke was apparently feeling particularly insane today since we just drive right through, turning the cops still on our hood into a cloud of red mist and bursting through the billboard at the end of the alley, with the whole gang leaping out the last minute for a spectacular explosive ending. The scene also forces the time of day here right as the cutscene transitions, so whatever time of day it was when you started the on-rail section, it will magically become midday as the cutscene finishes up something that I noticed all too late the numerous times I used it in episodes of GTA Biographies. Anyway, the gang splits up to let the heat die down, and now we only have one very important mission left before concluding this part of the game's story. Okay, it's time for the Green Saber, easily one of the most important story missions in the entire game, and it starts a lot like reuniting the families did, with Sweet calling a meeting at his house and announcing a plan for a second meeting of the Grove Street sets to reunite against the Balas, this time under the Mulholland intersection. As we leave Sweets, though, we get a phone call from Kendall's boyfriend, Caesar, asking us to come and meet him immediately, and although Carl tries to insist that he's very busy at the moment, Caesar insists even harder that we need to come and see him before heading over to see Sweet. So we gotta go meet him under the freeway near Unity Station. So you dragged me way across town to see what? Just in time, Esse. Take a good hard look over there. So, some ballers hanging around a dope spot. So what? Just watch, homie. What the fuck? Oh, no. Shit, Smoke, what you into? Shh, that's it. Look at that ride. That's the motherfucking green saber. Shit, Smoke. Crash making you sell us out? Moms! Sorry, Issy. I heard a rumor and poked around. I didn't believe it myself, but... Nah, nah, you did the right thing. I owe you, C's. I gotta go tell Sweet about... Oh, fuck! Sweet! Look, go get Kendall and take her to a safe place. What you thinking? It's Sweet. I think him and the homies is walking into a trap. Just go. Go!
So this scene is both the first big plot twist, Bombshell, and has become quite infamous for a number of reasons among the GTA fanbase, primarily due to the inclusion of Ryder. See, as you may have noticed, throughout that entire cutscene, Ryder is seen but not mentioned even once. Only Smoke is, and this, among other things, has led many fans to believe that at some point during development of GTA San Andreas, Ryder was meant to have a different role in the story, and was shoehorned into being a villain alongside Smoke at the last minute. As I mentioned before, I think there is some credibility to this idea, but I don't think that Ryder was never meant to serve an antagonistic role, perhaps even dying in the upcoming shootout to serve as motivation for CJ. There's just too much existing tension between CJ and Ryder in almost all of their interactions to believe that he was meant to just be another friend with no additional role beyond his missions, but I suppose we'll never really have a full explanation of exactly what happened, since Ryder's voice actor, MC8, has been asked about it, and his response was in my opinion less than informative, and just leaves me with even more questions. Anyway, now we know that Big Smoke was in some way responsible for the death of CJ's mother, something that becomes even more obvious when you watch the 20 minute introduction cutscene that came with the PC edition. So we have to rush over to the plant meet under the intersection, and try to warn Sweet since he and the rest of the Grove Street OGs are probably walking into another trap. We book it and try to phone him on the way, but he doesn't pick up his phone, and when we finally do arrive, it's already complete chaos, with Sweet pinned down and already bleeding in the middle of a group of Grove soldiers just barely holding out. CJ goes full superhero. Yo, Bob, I'm taking you, motherfucker. You hear me? I'm taking you all down, bitches. Which honestly always made me laugh, especially combined with the animation of him trying to go full Super Saiyan by the looks of it. And then we have to fight off a whole bunch of attacking balas, some on foot and others arriving in vans. Having a lot of SMG ammo here and using crouch to make sure all of your shots land is almost essential since, much like reuniting the families, most enemies here will be armed with at least SMGs and can pretty easily gun you down if you aren't careful. Eventually though, we kill all the Balas and then the LSPD arrives to arrest both Carl and Sweet, leaving their fates up in the air. You got a bag over your head, boy. How you feel about that? Man, take it off! Please, man! I can't breathe! Please! Oh, alright, but only because you said please. Well, we awaken to Officer Tenpenny taunting us, and eventually we learn that after the police arrived in the last mission, Sweet was arrested and we were transferred into the caring custody of Crash, who have driven us out to the city limits and into the middle of freaking nowhere. Nice, clean air. With Big Smoke's true allegiances revealed, and Sweet in prison upstate somewhere, we have no choice but to cooperate with Crash's demands and lie low while we put together some money to hopefully, eventually, get ourselves out of this mess. Our first task from Tenpenny and Pulaski is to find and silence a witness to their various shady dealings who is being guarded by the FIB, I mean FBI in this universe actually, while he awaits trial to testify against the corrupt officers. We're given a camera and a target and set loose to figure it out on our own. Well, since the game strips us of all of our weapons that we had before, naturally, I used the barely $500 I had left to buy a couple clips of 9mm rounds and well, that was it. I couldn't even afford to fill up all my armor, but oh well. Jumped on a Sanchez and then headed towards Mount Chiliad, where I knew I would have to be careful not to carelessly fling myself off the edges with reckless driving. Eventually, I reached the log cabin on the mountain's western edge, parked my bike in the woods, and tried to creep up on the FBI agents patrolling the exterior, but, well... I ended up in a rather brutal brawl against all of the agents while the witness tried to flee the building, but by the skin of my teeth, I managed to kill all of them with just my 9mm pistol, including the witness. Then all I gotta do is take a picture of the body, and I can steal his car. Yoink! And then head to the drop-off point of the trailer where Carl is staying in Angel Pine. So, we get two phone calls after completing this mission. The first is from Caesar, who tells us he's got Kendall and he's safe for now. Carl tells him to bring Kendall down to Angel Pine and hide out with him until things blow over in Los Santos, since at the moment it's not safe. He also says that he's sending backup, whatever that means, to help us out, and to meet them at a bar in Dillamore, so we have our next mission. The second call is from Sweet. All we learn is that he's still alive and inside, but that's about it. Carl vows not to forget his brother in there, and then we're back to country music on the open road as we make our way towards Dillamore. Man, I really do enjoy the atmosphere of this portion of the game. The country music, the rolling hills, the farms. It's all just so peaceful. Oh, God damn it! I don't even care if you're driving a saber. Do you know how frustrating it is when you do that? Whoa, I didn't mean to be that aggressive. Wait, what about my... Ah, uh, should have seen that coming. Damn, I'm hurt now too. Guess it's hitchhiking for me. Or I could take this guy's bike and get a workout in on the way to my next mission. 
Pump it up. I also decided last minute to steal somebody else's saber and drive up to Blueberry for some pizza to heal myself. Then it's back down to Delamore to meet Caesar's cousin, who I'm sure, just like him, is a very level-headed and down-to-earth person. Do you want some fatso? You big string of Yankee shit. Piece? I sing fucking Whoa. Eunice with more balls than juice. Oh. What the fuck do you want? Oh my. So this is Catalina's first appearance in the GTA series on the timeline anyway, and the first instance so far of a major character from a previous game making an appearance. This time as a mission giver for Carl, who just wants to make some money to help Sweet get out of jail. Somehow. I can't remember if Carl ever elaborates on exactly how making money would get Sweet released, but whatever. Minor details for now. So we have our first four Catalina robbery missions to do, and in a unique twist, we can actually do them in any order that we choose. But since we're already in Delamore, I tend to do the first one here, Tanker Commander. So we let Catalina blab a little bit and harass Carl, and then drive around the block and then pull into the gas station for our first big score. Hand over the tanking so I blow your fucking balls off! Alright, this lady certainly doesn't mess around, so let's grab the truck and get the hell out of here so we can spend as little time around her as possible. Now this mission can be a giant pain in the ass, but it all depends on how these two idiots behave on the road. Once we hitch up the truck, they'll start chasing us in my favorite car, and if they hit us at the wrong angle, they can disconnect the cab, which I was reminded pretty quickly fails the mission. Though, to be fair, this detachment was entirely my fault for taking a tractor-trailer off-roading. Now, one of my better plans. Luckily, the mission failed pretty close to Dillamore, so I just drove right back, started again, and this time stuck to the roads. And lucky me, they basically didn't give me any trouble this time. I actually cut through part of Los Santos, but there isn't really much of a penalty for coming back to the city early, so we could just pass over this bridge here that would have been blocked had we come before the mission of the Green Saber, and then we can deliver the truck and get our first decent-paying mission of the whole game. Very nice. You know, since this unlocks the trucker missions and I'm gonna need the money, screw it. Wait, I need a trucker hat first. Perfect. Now I'm ready. <coughs> Excuse me. So I spent the next 30 minutes doing a couple trucker missions and driving all across Red County and Whetstone, and you know, when I played this section as a kid, I had a slight disdain, as many of you still no doubt do, for country music. And I don't really know why. Now don't get me wrong, the blue jeans and the pickup truck style country and Pretty much all modern country is pretty trash, but old country and more specifically country western is honestly some damn good music. That's right, I like country music. Sue me. I have a feeling a big part of why I like it these days is my love for Fallout New Vegas, but that game keeps things exclusively country western for the most part, whereas this game's country station is more generic country. That being said though, I was really starting to enjoy just driving around, listening to the tunes, and soaking up the atmosphere. And it honestly makes me a little sad knowing just how short this section of the game will be. After all, we only have three more Catalina missions and a handful of others to complete before we move on to the next city, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Oh yeah, I also got a phone call while driving my trucker life. Yeah. Carl. Who is this? You know me. This is the truth. No, I don't. Perfection. They said you were a moron. Who? Okay, you can drop the act now, kid. You the police? No, we have a mutual friend and business partner. We do? Who? Yes. Have you killed any cops lately? Oh man, Ten Penny. I should've known. That asshole. So I've got a room at a motel in Angel Pine. Make sure nobody follows you. Well shit, when a stoner hippie calls, I gotta answer. Plus, you know, the whole blackmail thing through Ten Penny. Guess we have our next mission then. So now we have one of my all-time favorite missions in the entire GTA series. Body Harvest. We show up at the motel in Angel Pine and find Tenpenny stoned out of his goddamn mind and talking to demons or something. What? Oh! Yo, True, come here, man! Actually, it's just Pete Fonda. Tenpenny tells us that we have to come up with the cash to pay Mr. The Truth here for an enormous shipment of marijuana that we'll use for another mission much later on. Now, I think I'm starting to remember why Carl would say that he just wants to make some money to Catalina. To pay for the weed, not to help Sweet escape directly, but hey, what can I say, I'm already senile. Speaking of senility, we gotta convince the truth that we're worth trusting. And since Carl doesn't get down with Vietnamese opium, we'll have to instead steal a combine harvester from a group of fascists, as he puts it, and deliver it to his own farm. So we drive on over and get a little preview of just how well guarded the harvester is, and this is probably the hardest part of the mission, depending on your driving skills. See, if we head through the front here, there will be tons of rednecks, all armed with rifles that do quite a bit of damage. Something I remembered from my 100% playthrough on stream last year. 
so the best course of action is actually just to drive around all of them and approach the harvester from the side. I hop over the fence and take down the one guy nearby, but then as soon as I try to steal it, the driver gets out and tries to take me out with another one of those rifles. I gotta deal with him and then hop on in, and then we get to why this is one of my favorite missions. You don't ever get the opportunity to drive one of these again in a mission either, since though they will spawn, they're a bit annoying to get your hands on. So it's best to make the most of the time you get here and run over as many people as you can find. Thankfully, the game supplies us with a whole bunch of targets all lined up for us to harvest. After that, all we gotta do is drive it ever so carefully back to the Truth's farm while some rednecks chase us in a truck and try to shoot at us. I'm pretty sure the harvester is actually indestructible though, so we just gotta be careful not to fall into the water or flip the dang thing over, and eventually, we can safely return it to Truth's farm and complete the mission. Now all we need is the money to pay for all the weed that he'll be growing. Oh, also it's after this mission that Caesar actually leaves Los Santos with Kendall at Carl's request. The last time Caesar just said that he was sending Catalina, but I'm scripting this as I play, so that's going to be my go-to excuse for when I say things that are demonstrably completely wrong. So our next mission is actually just a cutscene. We head back to Angel Pine and meet up with Caesar and Kendall, where the reality of Smoke's betrayal finally sinks in for CJ. Took him a while, though. From here, we get access to the Radiant side missions involving attacking Smoke's shipment of coke. At least, I think. It might not actually be until we unlock San Fierro in the story, though we can't actually go there now, we just can't do anything there yet. After this cutscene plays, we get a phone call from our new, um, girlfriend? So then it's off to meet up with her at her mysterious and not at all serial killer-esque cabin in the woods for our next robbery mission. Once again, where we go and thus what mission we do here is entirely up to us, though the dialogue does stay the same based on how many of her missions we've already done. Once again, I usually do the local liquor store second since it's really close to her hideout, but it's a good idea to start this one only once you've bought at least a few hundred rounds of SMG ammo. We arrive at the liquor store, and it's literally already being robbed by a bunch of rednecks. So the mission then becomes a chase after Catalina kills one of them, and we steal his quad bike to go after the other three. This is, I believe, the first time that we saw a quad in a GTA game, and frankly, I pretty much always hate them. They seem to be even easier to crash than a bike and even easier to tip over than a big-ass truck, so most of the time, I dread this mission. Amazingly though, thanks to my SMG ammo and a bit of luck, we managed to take out all three of the fleeing rednecks relatively quickly without having to follow the entire meandering route, and I learned this time that you can actually pick up the briefcases they drop without getting off the bike, which I always did before for some reason. I guess that means that technically, if they fall off at the right angle, you could kill each one, instantly collect their briefcase, and then move on to the next one. And it makes me wonder what this mission looks like in a speedrun, but regardless, we grab all the money they drop, and then head back to the hideout to split it up, and... Man, that's it? After the payout from Tanker Commander, that is disappointing to say the least. It could be that the amount you make is based on the mission order and not actually the one you do. Anyway, that's one more done and two more to go. Well, before we get into more robbery shenanigans, I get a phone call from Caesar unlocking our next race mission. Well, I call it a race, but honestly, this mission and its twin, which we'll get to shortly, are both a complete joke. The only real threat to you in this mission is your own driving, since the only real way you'll lose is by crashing your car into the water. As long as you can avoid doing that, the other racers won't even stand a chance. The most significant thing about this mission actually isn't the gameplay, but the introduction of an important story character, Woozy, or more properly, Wootsie Moo, which is also the title of the mission itself. Oh, there's also some additional context here, I suppose, of Caesar introducing Carl to the actual countryside racing scene, if you can even call it that, since it will become important again later, after we finish the Catalina missions. Speaking of Catalina missions, it's time to head back and see Carl's lovely new girlfriend, where they finally consummate their passionate and mutually respectful relationship. Just kidding, Catalina goes full medieval on CJ. Ow! Hey! Ooh! Ow! Ow! Damn! Oh, shit! Honestly, if you listen to this cutscene, I'm not even sure that Carl actually participated. Either way, after that questionable experience, it's time to go rob some more shit, and this time it'll be a betting shop in Montgomery. This is definitely one of the easier of the Catalina missions. We show up, she does her thing with the clerks and murders someone, which, you know, always makes robberies go much smoother. Then we just gotta throw some satchel charges on the door, and the safe, and then grab the money to make our escape. The only thing we have to do after that is escape the 4 star wanted level that we're given, but out here in the country, the cops are barely even an issue. And since they'll mostly just throw the rancher trucks at you, we can just casually cruise over to Delamore to use the pay and spray, and then head back to the hideout. On the way back, CJ tries to convince Catalina to take it easy, but, I mean, it's a lost cause, and thankfully, upon completion, 
This mission also pays decently, so that's nice. Well, it's been fun robbing shit, but you know, I think it's time for a little break. Get out there, enjoy the country air, you know? Maybe I could... Ah, oh, hold on. What's up? Why just so cheery? You thought I was one of your cheap cars? What? The hell are you talking about? I chill out when you get here. Catalina, I am literally outside right now. No more talk. Get your ass up here now. Okay, okay. Jeez, calm down, lady. Calm down. Okay, so here we go. I saved the best for last, so to speak. We get one more cutscene at the cabin where Catalina finally breaks up with Carl, I guess. And then it's off to Palomino Creek for our big target, the bank. Now, since you can do these missions in any order you wish, it really makes the most sense to end with the bank, but I always do it in this order anyways. In fact, I wonder if the payouts are based on order entirely, meaning if you did the bank second, you'd always walk away with only $1,000? I'm not sure. So we head down there, and Catalina puts us on crowd control while she, um... I actually don't know what she does while we're doing this. What I do know is that this is impossible. No, I mean literally. Even with auto-aim and rapidly cycling through the targets, eventually the guard will start firing and the panic button will be hit. A bunch of cops show up and, though strangely we only get 3 star wanted level and not like 4 for the betting shop, then we have to shoot out some ATMs, grab what money we can and escape out the back door. Here we have a scripted fight through the alleys with cops on the rooftops and trying to ambush us from behind cover, but at the end of the alley we get access to some police bikes and then have to follow Catalina in another heavily scripted section. This is another instance that really feels like it served as inspiration for Rockstar down the line when making GTA V, and like in that game, there's basically nothing you can do here to change the outcome until Catalina hits the end of the script and gets stopped by some cops where you have to rescue her. Unlike most of the times I played this mission as a kid though, I was literally right next to her when she crashed, so she just jumps right back on our bike and then we head back to the hideout. For some reason, unlike the betting shop, we don't have to lose our wanted level here either, which is kinda strange, but hey, I ain't complaining. We drop her off, break it off, and then take our payment of $10,000, meaning there's only two missions left before we reach San Fierro. And next up is another race, and yes, it's lame. So this is the mission I mentioned earlier is like the twin to Wusi Mu. Why? Well, because it is literally the exact same race, just backwards. And I mean, come on, this ain't fucking Mario Kart Mirror Mode, you can't pull that shit. The only real difference here is that you're driving a car given to you by the mission instead of whatever you bring to it, so don't actually bring anything you want to keep to this race. Once again, much like Wootsie Moo, the most interesting thing about this mission is more to do with the cutscenes, as it's here that we meet Claude from GTA 3, though sadly, he doesn't say anything. Yes! And after beating him in a race, we also get a bit of a setup for the story in GTA 3, with this game taking place nine years before it. My lover needs his car so we can go to Liberty City. Liberty City? Anyway, there's only one mission left to do, but before we get to it, there's one thing that I did just before the second race. I visit an ammunition to buy a bunch of ammo and do the weapon challenges for the pistol, SMG, and shotgun. I'm pretty sure the only reason to do these is to help reach Hitman and those guns faster, and that's the only reason I was doing them, since, as I said before, I am not going for 100%, but sadly, completing them isn't enough to reach Hitman on their own, so we'll have to keep playing for that. Well, this is it, the finale to the countryside section. I know, pretty short, eh? Sad. Oh well. So we get a phone call from the truth telling us the weed is ready to be picked up, but I already knew it was coming and had already driven to his farm, so we can just jump right in. We pay him the cash, and thankfully, the game doesn't actually make sure we have enough money for it or even deduct it from our spendable cash, so I guess Carl was setting aside money from each of the jobs for this moment, or whatever. Truth has it all loaded into his hippie van, the mothership, but before we can start celebrating, the cops show up, and Truth has to think fast to avoid getting busted. You fucking rat. Dude, don't put that on me. You the one deal with Tim, Penny. What's all this? Calm, brother. Panic paves the way to bad karma. Man. We gotta torch those fields. I only hope Kaya can forgive us. This is also explained as being Tenpenny betraying Truth, but it really doesn't make any sense, since Tenpenny needs Carl to get the weed out of here, so he and Truth being arrested here would completely mess up his plan, but it's, I guess it's a rather small plot hole. Here we do have one of the cruelest things you're ever asked to do in any GTA game, though. Burn an innocent weed farm. Admittedly, the flamethrower is pretty fun to use, but be careful, since accidentally lighting yourself on fire is very, very easy to do. I remember as a kid I would always try to start at the top of each row and then just move backwards holding the fire button, but that will basically guarantee that you run out of fuel and have to go grab more from the shed, so instead you just gotta basically put any amount of flame on each of the little square patches, and it will eventually burn up completely. 
Once it's all burned, we have to rescue the truth who's being watched by a police helicopter, and to deal with it, he gives us a freaking loaded RPG that he was planning to turn into a lamp. Good thing he didn't. Take down the chopper and then hop into the van, and Carl phones Caesar to let him know of the plan. To meet up at the garage that Carl won from Claude and Catalina in the last mission, where our next major chapter of the story will begin. Ah, San Fierro, the city of psychedelic wonders, and my favorite city in this game and probably the 3D GTA universe. Though I could do without some of the ridiculous inclined roads. After settling in a bit by doing some taxi missions, I eventually start the main mission thread at our new garage, since I'm pretty broke, having spent very little time in Los Santos saving money. So, being the broke bitch that I am, I decided to start up some missions. Forgetting that nobody is paying us for anything we'll be doing for a while, which means, in this game, we actually don't get paid. This ain't GTA 3, where thousands of dollars drop out of the sky for doing just about anything. If we want lots of money to spend now, we'd have to work for it, and man, screw that. So this first Fierro mission also serves as a perfect introduction to the new city we find ourselves in. In this mission, Truth takes us around the city to recruit some people to help turn our crappy little garage into a mod chop shop. We grab those two stoner mechanics from GTA Vice City, Dwayne and Jethro, and then everybody's favorite David Cross character, especially him, Zero. Oh yeah, and there's a ton of conspiracy shit that Truth makes us go through. Actually, Truth seems to be the first time that Carl has ever been exposed to hippie talk, and it seems to legitimately freak him out a bit as he slowly starts to just kind of believe anything that Truth says must be at least somewhat true. I mean, it's right there in the name. Next up, we gotta follow up on something we did all the way back at the beginning of the country section of the game. That's right. It's finally time to drop that massive order of weed on whoever's life Tenpenny intends to fuck up. But I mean, that'll be on him, because there ain't no way we're snitching on anybody. Not even if- Carl, he's a DA! Oh uh, yeah? Well, where I go find him? So yeah, despite trying to arrest Truth earlier for some reason that's never explained, Tenpenny still wants us to use the weed that we bought from Truth using all the money from our Catalina robberies and dump it on a San Andreas district attorney who is having some kind of meeting at the Vankoff Hotel here in Fierro. Vankoff Hotel, dude, of course. Now, in my stream of this game and in my memory, this mission has occasionally been a giant pain in the ass, but at least this time, it went about as smooth as I could have hoped for. First, we gotta drive over to the hotel, nothing crazy there, and then follow the valet down into the parking garage, where we can liberate him of his uniform. And luckily, he's the same size as Carl, I guess. Then comes the part that normally kicks my ass. See, we gotta wait outside for the DA to show up and then take his car back to our garage in Doherty to have the weed planted in the trunk. The annoying part is that we have to do it without getting a single scratch on the car, so he doesn't know that we stole it, which means making the journey back and forth twice without crashing even once. Like I said, last time I did this on stream, it did not go well. This time, though, it was easy as pie, or maybe in CJ's case, pudding. After that, I decided that CJ needed to change his wardrobe. New city, new look, you know? Decided to go with the black on black on black on black on black. Anyway, our next mission is another one that makes CJ look like an actual psychopath. Remember that mission from OG Loke where we had to murder a music manager and his girlfriend? Well, now we have to murder an entire construction yard of workers because at least one of them is an asshole. Jeez, it's like when the teacher has to punish the whole class because one student is an asshole. CJ goes absolutely ham and destroys property, kills people, and literally buries the foreman in cement, covered in his own crap. So, like, that's some serial killer level shit right there. He says he's doing it to free up land for purchase, which wouldn't make it any better, but at least give a reason as to why. But in reality, we never purchase the land around the garage or do anything with it. CJ just kills all the workers at the construction site, and the company, I guess, assumes that it's cursed? Good call, it probably is. But unfortunately, our next mission is a bit of an annoying one. Actually, it's one of the crappier missions in the whole game. It doesn't do anything particularly badly, but it does commit the most unholy sin of gaming. It's boring. Okay, well, driving around the map in San Andreas is always fun, but from a gameplay perspective, you don't do anything unique in this mission. See, in this mission, we gotta go meet Caesar out by Blueberry, where he says he spotted a Bala's car that probably belonged to Big Smoke and was going to get resupplied or something. So first we gotta drive all the way from our garage in Doherty to Blueberry, and when we get there we have to take Caesar's car, which I swear to god is the most overturned prone car in the entire game, and then drive all the way to Angel Pine. Like, dude, couldn't we have just met you in Angel Pine? It's implied that we would be following a Bala's car, which would also be annoying since tailing missions suck, but we don't even get that, we just drive there. That's lame. When we do get to Angel Pine, literally all we do is go on top of a roof and take pictures of four people's faces. The heads of the Loco Syndicate, Ryder, T-Bone Mendez, Jizzy B, and Mike Torino. Though CJ and Caesar don't know all their names yet, only Ryder's. 
Then, to make the situation even more annoying, after finishing the mission, Caesar drives us to the gas station on the edge of Angel Pine and says we need to split up. So he just leaves us there. Which means in total we had to drive from Fierro to Blueberry, Blueberry to Angel Pine, and now Angel Pine back to Fierro. Unless we want to do some countryside missions and... We don't. So to start things off, the next time that I picked up the game, I got the idea to give Vigilante missions a try. Something I almost always do, only once I have access to the tank or the hunter attack helicopter. But what the hell, I'm feeling spicy. Now let me tell you, it was pretty close at times. I had to bring my police bike back to the shop a few times, rush to the pay and spray to lose the cops whenever I got more than one star. I had to contend with the targets trying to shoot up my tires the whole time, and at one point, I literally ran out of SMG ammo and had to stop and buy more, but eventually, I actually got it done. On my first attempt too, which is rare as hell for me. But I mean, look at this perfection of a final level. So I actually did Vigilante in the hopes that I would make enough money to buy Zero's shop, and luckily, I just barely did since I had to spend a few thousand bucks on that ammo I mentioned. Once I finished up, I saved it just to be safe, and then headed over to Zero's to start his mission thread and get it over with as fast as possible because, well, if you know, you know. So first up on Zero's list is the mission Air Raid. Now, I have been playing with a PS4 controller, but this is a mission which basically necessitates the use of my mouse for aiming, since these RC Barons can spawn pretty damn close, and it really doesn't take many hits to lose your transmitters. The real danger for this mission for me in the past has been trying to avoid hitting Zero myself with the minigun, since he dies, like, instantly. Luckily, once again, I managed to get it done on the first try, but those of you who are familiar with San Andreas already know what that means. Well, actually, in practice, supply lines really isn't that bad for me these days. Now, it's possible it has something to do with the frame limiter, because I definitely remember the time limit being way worse back in the day, and the fuel being a serious problem. And the last two or three times I've done this mission, all on PC, it hasn't happened, so I'm probably getting a bit of a pass on this nowadays. I didn't actually get that much better at the game since I played it as a kid. Not this much, I don't think, but who knows. The second courier did give me a bit of a problem, but even after being shot numerous times, my plane didn't smoke, and I basically had like a half or a quarter of a tank left when I finished the mission, so at least for this run, it was a piece of cake. What's next? Well, thankfully, this last Zero mission is by far the easiest. Now, as a kid, I always thought this mission was really cool, at least conceptually, it's pretty neat. When actually playing it, though, it's far too simple and not exactly complicated, which I suppose makes sense, but it just feels a little thrown in. We have to make sure that Zero can drive his car to the other side of the map using our heli with a magnet to drop bombs, move barrels, and drop bridges over the river. While you're doing that, Berkeley, Zero's nemesis, and the reason behind all of Zero's missions, will attempt to do the same back to us. The thing is, you can destroy Berkeley's helicopter, making it impossible for him to do anything else to stop you. So that's what I always do. After that, it's just tedious, a matter of destroying each of the tanks, dropping the two bridges, and clearing all the barrels, all the while listening to Zero complain about the barrel that's in his way, since it's safer to leave him at the start until all the tanks are dead. There's another cursed barrel in the way! I finish up so early that I have time to sit and wait at the finish line for a good minute before Zero even gets here, but thankfully, once he does, that's the end of his mission thread. And it also unlocks the store as an asset, meaning I can now collect up to $5,000 of regular revenue, which generates out front. Nice. But with the end of Zero's missions comes the beginning of the real mission thread here in San Fierro, the Loco Syndicates, starting with our good friend Charlie Murphy. I, I mean, Jizzaby. In this mission, we got to do a variety of tasks for Jizzy to impress him, starting with dropping off his girl, and then taking out a rival pimp in Hashbury. You also have to save another woman who's being attacked underneath an intersection, and then finally, you got to return to where you dropped off the first girl, and then we get to the fun part. Some preacher picks up the woman along with his bodyguards, and our goal is to then chase them down and take them both out. This mission can often be over really, really quick, but since you don't have a bike and you have to stay in Jizzy's car, it can also drag on for quite a while, since the streets of San Fierro don't make for great high-speed pursuits thanks to all the inclines. Eventually, we take them both out to the soulful sounds of James Brown, and that's one more down, many more to go. Well, let's not waste any time and jump right into the next Loco Syndicate mission. Okay, actually, I lied. I did waste some time. About 20 minutes, actually, just diving to the bottom of this body of water near the docks. Why? Well, because it will be necessary to start a mission later on. Yes, doing this, or something like this, is basically mandatory. Unless you spend an absurd amount of time before this just swimming around looking for Easter eggs in the water and got the lung capacity upgrades naturally, well, I doubt that anybody actually did that, but once that was done, or at least hopefully done, I headed back to the Pleasure Domes Club to start the next mission. Once again, just named after another member of the Syndicate who we're introduced to, 
this time T-Bone Mendez. This mission is pretty light on the details. Mendez gets a phone call saying some product is in trouble and we have to track down the truck to a spot under the freeway. Then four bikers take off with the product on the back of their bikes and we have to chase down all four across the city and snatch the stuff back either by killing them or just driving close to them and grabbing it if we're on a bike. There's no time limit so this is just really a matter of finding the four drivers across the map who also don't fight back and then driving back to where you started. Pretty simple. Not very engaging, but not bad by any means either, I guess. Let's see who we're going to meet next. As it turns out, it's James Woods, but we got to earn that introduction, by which I mean track down his character, Mike Torino, with T-Bone's help, and then rescue him. Now, in concept, this mission is simple. Drive to the first two locations, then the final location at the airport, find the van, kill the baddies, rescue Mike, and drive back. Simple. In execution, you got to be really careful when chasing down the baddies at the airport to not do that. And see, I feel like every time I do this mission, things like this happen. This mission is just begging for a million things to go wrong. Like the second time I tried it, I wanted to see if I could snipe the dudes on the bikes before we get close enough to trigger them running away. So I get out of my car, aim my rifle, and take the sh- Oh, for fuck's sakes, T-Bone. Anyway, third and final try, I actually get it. The key is to harass the van long enough that they all stop and get out, because once they do that, they're easy to deal with. Then we just got to escape a three-star wanted level from the airport, which is easy to do when you steal a helicopter. It's, however, less easy to fit a helicopter inside of a pay and spray, though. Anyway, with that done, we have no more Loco Syndicate missions for now, which means it's time to go see an old contact who gave us his number back in the countryside, Woozy. So, Woozy's first mission is a simple but fun and memorable one. It's this mission where we first are explicitly told of Woozy's curse, that being that he is, of course, blind. Guppy, Woozy's unnamed in cutscenes second-in-command, brushes this off as him having really good luck, but my dude, that sounds like some divine intervention crap, like Samuel L. Jackson in Pulp Fiction. Especially since we'll see in this mission that Woozy is so blind that he frequently runs headfirst into brick walls, so doing that while also participating in street racing is metal as fuck. This man has balls of steel. Anyway, in this mission we go with Woozy to check up on another group of triads who didn't show up to the last big meeting between all the triad groups in Fierro. We drive just around the corner and get a comical introduction to just how bad Woozy's sight is, as well as how fragile his pride can be, and then we come across the other triads. Turns out, they've been completely wiped out, apparently by some of the newer small-time Vietnamese gangs, who we've been briefly introduced to by the truth back in our first mission here. As we go to leave, we are ambushed by these guys, the Da Nang boys, and have to fight our way through a small wave of them before reaching a car which miraculously spawned in the alley, and then making our escape. Now, the game says you're supposed to actually let Woozy destroy the attacking cars here, which I do, but I can't remember if you can destroy them yourselves anyway. I'm pretty sure you can, since I don't remember a fail state for this mission because of that, as well as for a variety of other reasons, but, but luckily, Woozy also seems to be packing one powerful-ass pistol, because as long as he's in range, he makes short work of them, and then we can drop him off at the Mountain Cloud Boys HQ for a mission complete. Nice, that's the first decent-paying mission we've done since we got here. On to the next one. So our next mission, we are introduced to somebody that I think is a higher rank than Woozy, but I don't actually understand triad hierarchies. Ron Fa Lee here uses a translator, since he apparently only speaks in grunts, and asks us to collect a package from the airport that is apparently important. So we happily oblige, since we're getting paid. Drive on over to the airport, and I remember this mission well, so I try to be sneaky and play some satchel charges at the door, but once I get in the car that has the package inside, the cutscene plays, and the exits are blocked by the Da Nang boys. But... Oh, my satchels got despawned during the cutscene. Expected, but still a shame. Anyway, I just blow up the truck anyway and make my escape, stopping at the second roadblock to kill the guards and avoid extra damage on the car, and then manage to keep my distance from the pursuers all the way downtown when this happened. I'd also run over a cop earlier, so I was dealing with both the scripted Danang boys chasing me and the cops, and very nearly was busted when this bastard pulled up right at the intersection, but thankfully, eventually, I make it to the garage and get another fat payment for a job well done. Next, I decided to jump back into the CJ Loco Syndicate missions, which for some odd reason were marked by a red triad symbol back at the garage, but anyway. This mission starts with a phone call from Jizzy, who tells us to meet T-Bone in a four-door sedan by some gas station. The weird thing is, though, Carl gets there and nobody seems to be around, but thankfully this gas station had exactly one four-door sedan just sitting there doing nothing, so CJ decides to just get inside that one. Good thing it was the right one. But then T-Bone pops up from the back and starts strangling Carl, trying to see if he'll break under pressure or if he's some kind of mole or undercover cop. But wait, let me stop you for a sec, game. How in the hell did CJ approach this car without seeing T-Bone, a guy who is not exactly shown to be small, crouched in the back seat? 
he had nothing covering him or anything. So I guess CJ's just like blind, which, okay, you know what? Actually, I can relate to that since I can totally do this. After our brief S&M play, which the pedestrians near the pizza place at the end of the last mission foreshadowed, I think I'm gonna try S&M. You tried it? Yeah. yeah! Torino shows up too, and we all drive over to a factory nearby where we are given a sniper, a rocket launcher, and 20 rockets, and a Sanchez motorbike, and are tasked with guarding the van as it makes its way to the Loco Syndicate drug factory. I remember this mission giving me some trouble as a kid, but all you need to do really is come well armed, and don't waste too much time in between each roadblock, and the van will basically never be in danger. I mean, you don't even need to come super well armed, since the previously mentioned rocket launcher and 40 sniper rifle shots you're given are pretty much more than enough to deal with most of the enemies blocking the road. Just gotta be careful and don't waste time or ammo, that's about it. One really cool thing about this mission is that, like in a GTA Online mission, the cops are completely disabled, as I learned when I accidentally blew up this cop car. You can do whatever you want during this mission and never get a wanted level, so it's basically an invitation to go a little bit crazy, but <laughs> I'm definitely better than that. We take out the last roadblock and then slowly watch as the van makes its way through the rubble to the drug factory, but I realize towards the end of the mission that it won't actually end until I go inside the compound, so... Ah, it's good to get that out of my system. Now to finish up the mission. Oh fuck, all the bad things I did are coming back to haunt me. Not again! I decided to keep doing CJ missions, but the next one is among my least favorite in the game. It's not horrible, but it's just a bit boring. Snail Trail. See, this is another crash mission, our second one in San Fierro, and once again we're doing the dirty work of keeping all of Tenpenny and Pulaski's corruption from reaching any courts, this time by silencing a witness, or cop, who's been speaking, and the reporter that they're meeting all the way in Los Santos. First, we have to collect a sniper rifle that Tenpenny provides us nearby, but as soon as we pick it up, we learn that the reporter is at the train station across the street, and then we really gotta haul ass because this train has apparently been given clearance to go faster than any of the other trains in the game up to this point. We grab the conveniently placed motorcycle, and then follow the tracks making sure to stay ahead of our target, and watch for several scripted trains running on the opposite track. But eventually, we reach Market Station in LS. Alright, here with time to spare. Oh god damn it! I just needed like two extra sec- Then comes the really boring part. We have to wait for the better part of like two minutes until the NPC actually physically walks from the train up the stairs and hails a cab. Then we have to do everybody's favorite type of GTA mission, a tailing mission, and follow his cab to where he's meeting the snitch. The worst part is, you can't go to the destination if you already know it, and you can't get too close without spooking him, so you have to stay a specific distance away from him as he drives all the way to the pier where, finally, we can gun them both down. Nice. Now to drive back to San Fierro. Unfortunately, our next woozy mission is also kinda boring and one of the crappier ones in the game, Lure. Literally all we do in this mission is drive from Chinatown San Fierro, you chump, all the way back to Angel Pine, and then follow a convoluted path through the back beyond across the countryside, and then stop at a truck stop along the freeway. I mean, technically it is more complicated than that. When you finally reach Angel Pine, and it should be noted that this is the second mission in San Fierro that has asked us to drive all the way out here, the scripted enemies finally show up and you actually have something to do. Here, the chasing bikers will try to damage your car enough to see inside of it, and if they do manage to do that, you'll fail the mission, as they'll figure out that you're just a decoy, and return to attack Ron Fali sooner than he's expecting. But as evidenced by the fact that I drove the entire mission without damaging my car once, it is not that hard to avoid or kill these guys. And I don't know that I've ever failed this mission even once because they managed to see inside. If I have, it's been so long that I don't even remember what the mission fail scene looks like, and after completing it, although we do get another good payout, we once again have to drive all the way back to San Fierro to actually start any more missions, which is just a bit annoying, especially since this is the second time. Next, I tackled a mission that I definitely had my fair share of trouble with the last time I did it on stream last year, but for me anyway, playing a game on stream and my own time are very different experiences. So, Caesar gives us a silenced pistol, since in an unheard phone conversation, Woozy tells us it's time to kill Jizzy and retrieve his phone so that we can intercept a local syndicate meeting. Oh, and Caesar also claims that he got his pistol at the same place he bought his pants, but I think he's lying. None of the clothes shops in this game sell guns to me. So I head down to the Pleasure Domes Club and try to get in the front doors, but the bouncers tell us that Jizzy is having a private function, so we'll need to be a little bit more creative. Or maybe we would, but this is a Rockstar game, so we're instead told basically exactly where we need to go to get inside. The scaffolding alongside the nearby Gant Bridge, GTA's take on the Golden Gate. We leap down from the bridge onto the roof of the building and make our way inside through a conveniently opened window and then... Fuck it. 
Also jump down to the middle of the club, since despite the instructions, you can't actually kill Jizzy yet, and there's no danger, we just gotta enter the cutscene first. Charlie Murphy gives us one more great performance, and then the cutscene cuts off, and somehow he manages to escape out the door. We fight our way through the bodyguards, many of which are the prostitutes who work the club that now pack AK-47s, and then run outside to see Jizzy escaping in a new pimpmobile with one of his guards. This is the part that would normally cause me to fail this mission, since Jizzy can escape if you don't get into a vehicle fast enough, and the limo the game provides you is slow as ass. Thankfully, I had arrived in style earlier and left my car right by the front door just for this occasion, and quickly gave chase. All you gotta do here is make sure to set the car on fire, but don't fully blow it up with your weapons. And then Jizzy will leap out of the car and you can kill him and take the phone. If you blow up the car with him in it, it'll blow up the phone too and you'll fail, so... As soon as you pick up the phone, you'll lose any stars you had too. And then we're set up for one of the final missions of the San Fierro main mission thread. But before we do that, we should go finish up Woozy's missions. Now, this is the mission that I prepared for a long time ago. If I hadn't spent the better part of a half an hour swimming up and down in the water around San Fierro, starting this mission now would trigger a unique cutscene where you learn that Carl is a bad swimmer, and thus can't do the mission. What's weird is that if I remember right, the cutscene kind of vaguely implies that Carl has always been a bad swimmer, but then if you go and swim around for a bit and come back, apparently he's cool with it now. Anyways. Even though I just finished shitting on Rockstar for not giving enough freedom in missions, sometimes they would, and this mission is a good example. After the annoying swimming section, you're given a task. Get on the boat and plant a bug, and do it stealthily, but that part is entirely optional. Your only actual goal here is to plant the bug, and doing so while killing everybody in your path is also a completely valid option, and definitely the one that I took. Blow up all the guard boats, snape out the lights for no reason because you can, and then climb on board the tanker to make your way through the rest of the enemies who definitely know that I'm here by now. Get inside, plant the bug, and then get the hell out of there, but now there's only one woozy mission left to do in San Fierro, and it will involve returning to this ship, or... Maybe it's another similar looking ship? It's confusing. So let's get ready to wrap up things in Fierro, or at least the main missions. So we meet up with Woozy, and he's on his way to some kind of important meeting when he gets a call. Apparently, the Danang boys are making their move into the U.S. full scale right now, and another triad, Little Lion, has gone to meet Guppy and take the fight to them. Carl volunteers to take care of this for Woozy, so we go to meet Little Lion and head up into the air armed with a minigun and infinite ammo for an Apocalypse Now-esque sequence. Now, I think because of the phone call, it's also vaguely implied that Guppy is on board, but uh, I don't know. He definitely shows up in later missions, so he probably isn't here. Why do I say that? Well, for all those who are annoyed at scripted sequences and otherwise playable segments of gameplay, like what goes on all the time in GTA V, know that Rockstar didn't start there. They have been doing so for quite some time, and this is one of the first examples that really annoyed me even back in the day. See, as we approach this ship, we gotta gun down these dudes on top of the containers. But no matter what we do, as we round the ship, a guy will spawn who you can very clearly shoot, but who will refuse to die. He'll shoot the heli with an RPG and cause it to crash, initiating the next part of the mission. Now, if this had happened in a cutscene, it wouldn't annoy me as much, but it's more like those sequences in GTA V, like the mission Father-Son, where the game is scripted such that you are sort of railroaded into completing the mission the specific way it intends, but instead of using cutscene, it just breaks the laws of physics when necessary. Anyways. After we crash, we are forced into a manhunt-like stealth section that lasts for like 60 seconds, and then we have to make our way through a maze and a bunch of enemies to reach those trapped refugees in the ship's lower section. There's this one asshole who is a beginner's trap as he lobs a grenade at you that can very easily kill you, but as long as you avoid taking the full brunt of the hit, it's not too bad cleaning this place out. Free the refugees and then climb your ass back out to reach the bridge and fight the snakehead or boss of the gang, I guess. In this fight, the dude tosses you a katana and basically implies that you should have a fair fight, but you can very easily just shoot him if you want anyway. Having recently replayed Saints Row 1, it actually makes me wonder if that's what this scene was referencing, but since San Andreas also doesn't force you to duel with melee, I'm not 100% sure. Slice and dice the dude and then head down to meet the refugees, who have lowered a dinghy off the side of the ship, and bam, that's the end of Woozy's missions in San Fierro. But we will definitely be seeing more of him later on. Alright, this is it. Sort of. This is one of the final missions of the San Fierro main story, and a great example of how unfinished the game starts to feel as you play on. Now, it just so happened the way I'd done the missions that as soon as I finished the last one, I parked my boat at the pier, and the mission was ready to go. So, I like to think that immediately after taking down the Denongs in Universe, Carl then disrupts the Loco Syndicate meeting. So, we meet Caesar on the roof and are given a sniper rifle to watch over the big meeting of all the bosses, including T-Bone Mendez, Ryder, and Mike Torino, and it probably would have included Jizzy, but, you know, he did. So, some of Woozy's boys show up to back us up and head to the roofs, but a group of San Fierro Rifa catch them and threaten to blow their cover since, apparently, nobody on the ground hears the gunfire? So, we snipe all the Rifa, and again, I guess nobody hears our incredibly loud sniper rifle shots, but then the whole thing is busted anyway when Mike Torino arrives via chopper and spots all the bodies on the roof. Great. 
Now we gotta head into the Smokeville area and kill all the Balas and Rifa who stand between us and Tebow and Mendez. But I like to use the sniper rifle ammo they gave me here as much as I can. Especially because I didn't go to ammunition between the end of the last mission and starting this one. And in that last mission, you lose all the weapons you had when the heli crashes. So all I had was the sniper, 300 rounds of SMG ammo, and a katana. But that's more than enough for CJ. We then have to kill T-Bone. No dialogue, no show or big display, just shoot him. And then a small cutscene shows CJ and Caesar executing him. And then Ryder tries to escape by jumping off the pier and swimming towards some boats. Now, I guess most people would normally follow Ryder and chase him down in the second boat, but for whatever reason, I have basically never done it that way. Instead, I always save enough sniper rounds to just shoot him from the pier and bam, mission complete. Again, that ending had no dialogue from T-Bone at all, and reused lines for Ryder of him just saying, can't stop me in previous missions. Not to mention no visual appearance from Mike Torino either, and no cutscene to start or end it. This mission is supposed to be like the reuniting the families or green saber of this story chapter, and it just feels really lackluster. It's not awful by any means, but compared to what it feels like it should have been, it's a bit disappointing. The whole San Fierro Loco Syndicate story feels very rushed, and we literally only have one more mission before the entire story beat is basically forgotten about. Speaking of rushed missions... So next up, we have a mission with yet again no cutscene that just begins with a phone call at the garage, and then we have to head over to find Torino. More annoying, the phone call alludes to things that sound like they would have been in cutscenes, like CJ apparently asking Woozy's men to find Torino's van, but instead we just get the phone call. So we drive over to the police station downtown, real inconspicuous Torino, and there are a bunch of random thugs guarding the helipad. We fight them off and avoid the dude on top with an RPG, and then Torino escapes in the helicopter and we have to chase him down. Now if you're quick enough, you can grab the rockets and shoot him right away, but if you're not, you'll have to chase him down on the freeway. Get ahead of him enough to jump off the bike and whip out your pocket rockets and BAM! Torino can't have survived that fireball. Oh wow game. Very subtle. Very subtle. On to the finale, and at the very least, this one does have a cutscene. And more so, it has a scene wherein Carl actually reflects on his killing of Ryder, and it's this scene alone that always makes me skeptical of the commonly accepted theory that Ryder was never meant to be a bad guy in the original script. Either way, Woozy shows up and tells us in order to fully put down the Loco Syndicate once and for all, we'll have to blow up their factory here in the city. So we gotta head over to one of his boys and pick up a car rigged with explosives. It was during this mission that the problems I have with San Andreas' story started to crystallize a little bit more. This whole Loco Syndicate business was all related at least tangentially to Big Smoke, the main antagonist and the main reason we left Los Santos. After this, though, the entire Big Smoke story is just kind of put on hold. I mean, presumably Smoke gets a new supplier, since the whole point of going after the Syndicate was to hurt Smoke, but if destroying it did affect him, it clearly wasn't very much, as we'll see when we finally reach him in the fourth act or whatever. Getting distracted here. So this mission sees us assault the factory, which we got in the drug van to in an earlier mission, and it's really very simple. Drive inside, kill the dudes in our way if necessary, park the car, arm the bomb, and then escape. Well, normally it's a little bit more complicated. As you go to leave, the game normally locks the gate and you have to use a car to jump the wall and then escape, but I had gotten the cops right as I started the mission, and it just so happened that a motorcycle cop had followed me inside. So without even triggering the cutscene which locks the gate, I was able to leap the wall and head right back to the garage. Mission complete. Again. Not a whole lot of fanfare, certainly a lot less than was at the end of the Los Santos section, or maybe even the countryside section with Are You Going to San Fierro feeling very tense. Instead, now Smoke's distribution ring has been dismantled and, uh, I guess that's it? But we're still banned from LS, so now what? Well, the answer to that is, go back to school. Hooray? I always thought this was a little bit odd, but for whatever reason, there are four missions locked behind not only completing the main stories in San Fierro, but also completing the driving school. Now, odds are, by the time you finish the main story missions in Fierro, you will fairly soon afterwards head to Tierra Robada to meet Mike Torino, spoilers, and from there head up to Las Venturas soon after that. So it's weird that these missions all take place during a time when it looks like Carl and company are fully living in San Fierro. I probably originally did these missions, and I bet a lot of you did too, after having unlocked Las Venturas and maybe even bought some property there. Now, maybe it's not all that weird for an up-and-coming gangster entrepreneur to be frequently traveling between the equivalent of San Francisco and Las Vegas, but I don't know, it seems like a bit of a stretch. Now, none of these missions are required for beating the game, and although they are needed for 100%, I won't be doing that either. I just always try to do these because they feel like they fit in with part of the story the game was trying to tell, even if, like a lot of other storylines, it just kind of gets dropped once we get to Venturas. Anyways, driving school. In order to actually unlock these missions, we need to get at least bronze in all of the driving school courses, and for literally all but one of them, that's not really hard at all. But there is one. Oh boy, there is one. 
a single course, which no matter how many times I play this game, I never get good consistently enough to pull it off in any amount of time that would preserve my sanity. I spent a literal hour grinding out this course, and it was pretty much the same back when I did it for my 100% stream last year. Every time I have to do it, I hate it. The only reason I put up with this is to unlock the garage missions, even though arguably they aren't all that special. When I finally did do it this time, though... Well, I'll be goddamned. So first up, we have Zeroing In, where all we have to do is track down this lady in her car who's driving around the west side of Fierro, and use the pit maneuver we learned in driving school to spit her out. She gets out of the car, we nab it, drive it back to the garage. Simple. Second, we have one that is another great example of Rockstar's game design philosophy, which would become highly scrutinized by the time of GTA V, with heavily scripted chase sequences. We drive over to this car showroom on the north end of town and drive two cars out of the window on the top floor. Then we just have to keep up with Caesar as we run through the scripted chase, with some, but not literally all of the traffic like in 5, being deliberately placed there and scripted to behave in specific ways. Also, there is randomly construction on this road for this mission and this mission only. This mission is fairly simple, but it's actually a lot of fun and definitely one of my favorite from the Garage Asset missions. Third, we have my least favorite of the Asset missions. Here, all we have to do is drive down to the docks and use a crane to move these three containers onto the ground. The crane controls are really the annoying part. The third one always contains the car we're looking for, and once we find it, a bunch of goons show up, and then all we gotta do is hop back into the car and drive to the... <clears throat> like I was saying, all we gotta do is hop in the car and drive back to the garage. There we go. One more to go. Last but not least, we have Puncture Wounds, which is one of the very few times in the game where we're given access to police stingers, which feels like yet another wasted opportunity for this game. Like, how come we couldn't mod these into cars after this mission? Lame. All we gotta do is catch up to this lady and use the spikes to pop her tires, swap them out for new ones, and then leave the car that we presumably brought with us in the middle of the highway, and then return back to the garage, looking brand spanking new, since Caesar made it clear... Our wrecked car is no good to us! So with the conclusion of the garage side missions, we have basically finished all missions in San Fierro, and are finally ready to move on to the second to last chapter of the game, as it were, the Badlands. We get a phone call after completing the mission Yay Kaboom Boom, which tells us to come meet the owner of this mysteriously garbled voice at a ranch across the river in Tierra Robada. Now, the more direct route would be to take the Garver Bridge, as it's basically right there once we get off, but I like to take the scenic route, as the game's version of the Golden Gate, the Gant, really never gets to shine in any of the missions, as this corner of the map is basically never used. Once we finally get there, we are greeted not by the person on the phone, but by presumably one of their henchmen, who for some reason tells us we have to prove ourselves by driving a monster truck around the desert really fast. Uh, okay. This mission is really lame, actually, but thankfully it does give us the best line of dialogue in the entire Grand Theft Auto series, so there's that. Now first we need to see what you're made of. What'd it look like I'm made of? Putin? I feel like this mission would make a lot more sense if it were to prepare for a mission after, which involved using the monster truck in like a tight time window, since, spoilers, the owner of the mysterious voice is Mike Torino, who is secretly a government agent. Maybe he would have some kind of weird specific government job that required the use of a monster truck, I don't know, but as it stands, this mission is just kinda here, and after completing it, we still have no idea what's going on. Thankfully though, there's nothing to do here except continue on to the next mission, so... The next mission is when we finally actually learn that it was Mike Torino making those mysterious calls. Though anybody who was familiar enough with James Woods' voice acting probably already figured that out. I was fiddling with my keyboard when this cutscene was playing, so I accidentally skipped it, but basically, we have to hijack a truck of chemicals, I guess, and deliver it safely to our garage. Afterwards, Mike's G-Men will presumably sweep in and make it disappear. So this is a two-man job, which means we need a partner, and thankfully, Mike already called Caesar and filled him in on all the details. Hell, Caesar doesn't even ask what the plan is until we're speeding down the freeway on a motorbike. What's the plan? I'm gonna pull alongside, and you're gonna hop aboard. Oh shit, you didn't mention that on the phone. It'll be a walk in the park. Tell Kendall I love her. This mission has definitely given me some trouble in the past. You're relying a bit on luck here, since depending on the traffic, you'll have different obstacles thrown at you while you're trying to stay alongside the truck cab. Sometimes literally, as this truck pushes literally anything in front of it out of the way, like it's not even there. I crash the bike and have to drive all the way around the median too, since Caesar can't jump for shit, but luckily, I managed to get him back on in time to catch up with the truck again before it gets off the freeway. I can't actually remember how far you can let it go before the mission fails, but I seem to recall you can't let it get off the freeway. Either way, we ride alongside long enough for Caesar to make a mad leap to the door and kick the driver out. 
He parks it awkwardly on the freeway though, and since we're expected to drive, I literally have to climb through Caesar to get in the front, and then drive it back to the garage. Where this happens. I've played this game for 19 years, and this has never happened before. I am so glad that I caught this on camera. Anyways, now we're working for the government, I guess. So, what's next? Well, what's next is a bit of a doozy. Well, it's not that bad. Interdiction sees us learning more about the complex web of conspiracy that Mike has wrapped us in, or rather, Tenpenny ultimately, I guess, but he also makes it clear that Sweet is in no danger. So long as we do exactly as he says. We have to retrieve a package from a helicopter making a drop in the desert nearby. When we get there though, the drop chopper is intercepted by a rival agency chopper, and we have to use the RPG provided, or whatever else we have on us, to destroy them. Now, with a controller, I actually failed this one. I used up all 40 of my rockets and didn't hit either of the choppers once. Yeah, it was that bad. When I went back to try it again though, I just said screw it and used the mouse and keyboard for this section. Lo and behold, I had it done nice and quick, and the heli didn't even lose half of its health. After that, we have to tediously drive even further to actually collect the package, and then drive it all the way back to Las Brujas, the ghost town where we got the rocket launcher. This whole section of the mission was a waste of time, I feel like. I mean, I guess you get a wanted level, so you have to contend with the country cops, but it's only like two stars, and they are hardly a threat. I mean, look at these guys. Oh, you guys done your shift, eh? Alright, see you later. Ah, and you must be the next shift. I did come comically close to dying here, though. Oh boy, that's too close. But it wasn't the mission's fault, just my own natural tendency to be an idiot, so I can't rightly chalk it up to this section being warranted. Anyway, we're almost done with the first phase of Mike Torino's missions, as our next mission isn't really a mission at all. We simply have to watch a cutscene and then purchase this airfield, where we'll have to complete the pilot school for the second phase of his mission thread. Now, I may or may not have realized when I got to the airport that I didn't have enough money to buy it. And then, I may or may not have spent an hour losing at the casino before I finally gave up and used the Hiso Yam cheat code to give myself $250,000. I may or may not have. I'll leave it up to your imagination. Remember back at the beginning when I said this would be a cheatless, deathless run? Yeah, um, so anyway, then I learned how to fly. Into the distance. Not now, David. And immediately afterwards, I got a call from Woozy about joining him at his new operation, which he mentioned back in San Fierro. It's a casino, the four dragons on the strip. And normally, I would complete all of the Mike Torino airstrip missions first before going to Ventura's, but this time I figured screw it, and took a cab to the city. And by took a cab, I mean I flew an airplane over the Ventura's strip, jumped out and let the plane crash into a building, and then stole the first taxi that I saw to drive 20 feet to the actual casino. Hey, what happens in Ventura's stays in Ventura's. Then it's time to start the casino mission thread with Fender Ketchup, one of my favorite mission titles. This mission is mostly for story and is very simple in execution. You gotta drive around town with this guy tied to the hood of the vehicle and avoid crashing head on into things which will kill him, or using the freeway which will net you a 3 star wanted level. Now when you're awful at the game, like me, it's exceedingly easy to get him killed by accident. When you actually pay attention though, all you really gotta do is drive around the strip a couple times, really fast without crashing, and doing a couple hairpin turns and boom. He reveals that he is, in fact, Johnny Sendako, a character we met only once in the introduction for the original PC version of San Andreas, but who has otherwise never been mentioned so far. More importantly, we now know that the ones responsible for giving Woozy's boys a hard time are the Sendako family, who own a stake in another casino just up the road, Caligula's. Our next casino mission involves the first step in Carl's ambitious plan to rob the Mafia Casino as revenge for them trying to muscle in on the triads. Woozy suggests stealing explosives from a quarry just outside of town, so it's off to break into private property and steal several sticks of dynamite. When we get there, we have to reach all four explosives and break the boxes that they're in with a large vehicle before collecting them, but the first real challenge is just getting down there fast enough. Or at least it is when you're an idiot and don't use the, like, four cars the game gives you right at the gate. Luckily, the workers here only have melee, so they aren't much of a threat, but make sure to take out the guy moving one of the crates with a forklift early on, or he'll play cat and mouse with you. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, I had two stars when I started this mission and the cops followed me all the way into the quarry, so when I actually collected all four sticks of dynamite and then had to deal with the security, I had to also contend with the cops, who'd already entered the quarry as I made my way back up. Now the game prompts you to escape in a specific way using the Sanchez and a series of jumps, but I decided to try and be different this time, and went out the way I came in, only for this to happen. 
Huh. Lesson learned, I guess. Then I used what little dirty cheater money I still had to buy a new arsenal, which included the M4, now finally available. So in the end, it all worked out. Then I went back and did the mission the intended way, following the path out of the quarry on the dirt bike, and delivering the goods to one of Woozy's boys just off the freeway. So since the game still hasn't forced me to go back and finish the Torino missions, I decided to just continue with the bank heist thread because, after explosive situation, the missions of the four dragons split into two separate threads, one for the main story and one for the heist. Our first true heist mission, then, is architectural espionage, where we have to steal a copy of the blueprints for Caligula's Casino from a planning department downtown. Well, we'll take a low-quality picture of the plans anyways. So we head down to the planning department, and we were actually asked to use the rarely seen dialogue feature by replying positively to this receptionist. I was very tempted to do it, but I didn't ultimately see what happens when you reply negatively, but it would be pretty funny if it just failed the mission. So the lady directs us to the top floor, and once we get there, the game walks us step by step like a four-year-old through exactly what we need to do to get access to the room without anyone seeing us take the picture. I feel like this mission is a good example of one of my biggest gripes with Rockstar's game design, especially as the years have gone on. If instead the game had hinted at what to do and given you the chance to figure out that you need to destroy this vent to cause a fire and clear the room, that could have been really cool. But what we actually get is, go here, do this, now go here, do this, now fight bad guys. Oh yeah, for whatever reason, even after doing everything stealthily, the cops will still come after us and we have to fight our way down the stairwell shotgunning a single cop on every corner. When we exit the building, I had parked my bike right at the entrance and thankfully it didn't despawn, so I was able to rush right back to the four dragons with four stars to finish the mission. I don't know if it was just this time, but for whatever reason I barely encountered any police resistance on the way back, even with four stars. I only saw like two patrol cars and not a single SWAT truck, but I'm not complaining. On to the next one, what do we got? Next, we have to acquire a key card from one of the employees over at Caligula's. I should note at this point, too, that as we see in the cutscene, Carl is 100% the guy who had the idea and is planning this entire thing. And this is no small heist. We're robbing a mob casino, and CJ, with experience like robbing townhouses, just walks in with complete confidence that he can pull off something of this scale, and ruthlessly, too, as this mission will demonstrate. See, to get that key card, Carl's plan is to seduce one of the women working at Caligula's in order to steal it. Here's where things get amusing and confusing, though. We gotta do a very annoying tailing mission and follow this woman in a convoluted path to reach this sex shop where she buys what looks like a dominatrix outfit, but then she speaks to a Benny on the phone whom she refers to as Master. Okay, that doesn't really make any sense. Then we have to go out and put on a gimp suit for some reason, which again makes no sense as to why CJ would hear her say Master and assume she's meeting a gimp. Then we have to follow her to her house, kill a guy carrying a giant dildo, presumably Benny, who is very clearly not wearing a gimp suit, and then knock on Millie's door, who for some reason greets us enthusiastically. I mean, this is very, very clearly not the guy she was waiting for, but she doesn't care. What's more, after sleeping with her in this very strange setup, she's now Carl's girlfriend. Alrighty, the world of GTA is a strange one. So now the game expects us to wine and dine Millie until our relationship status is high enough, at which point she will let us into her house and we can get the card. However, this full-length game vault has already taken way too long to come out, and unfortunately for Millie, I am going to expedite this process by doing this. <laughs> to be fair, I pretty much always do it this way since the dating mechanic is very bare bones, and it's annoying to have to do it the long way even if I wasn't trying to get the video out, so sorry Millie. Once she's dead, CJ makes an awkward call to Woozy, and then we go inside to her place and nab the card. Things are starting to escalate, though, as our next task involves breaking into the GTA Universe equivalent to Hoover Dam in order to place explosive charges on the generators, which will knock out power to all of Las Venturas. Jesus. Now, I'm no math magician, but I'm pretty sure this would cause an insane amount of infrastructural damage, be probably the biggest act of terrorism ever committed in the United States, and almost certainly lead to the unintentional deaths of a lot of people, all to darken a casino long enough to rob it because of petty gang rivalries. Like I said, things have escalated. So, with our newly acquired pilot's license, we head over to the airport, steal a plane that seems like it was suspiciously placed here for us, and then fly over the dam to parachute high above it and infiltrate. The actual area we're reaching in the game is not all that difficult to reach with just a boat, so I have no idea why we're once again being convoluted about it, but whatever. There are at least two more instances in this mission of that annoying Rockstar design. When parachuting over the dam, it's not enough to just, well parachute over the dam, you have to reach a specific height and fly through this specific ring to trigger a cutscene, where the plane crashes and then you can parachute down to the spot you're meant to land. When you do land, the game prompts you to be stealthy, but there is literally no point. 
and you can't even enter the dam after killing the guards. You have to pick up the knife the game provides you because it expects you to be quiet. Until you pick up that blade, the door won't appear, so I guess the knife is some kind of key sometimes, too. Or it's a key all the time, and when you stick it in people, it unlocks their death. Inside, we once again are expected to be quiet, with guards patrolling and shadows to take cover in, but like, why? The guards aren't a serious threat, and killing them or going loud in general doesn't bring down like a heavy wanted level or anything, so, like, screw that noise. Or I guess, screw that quiet. Plant charges at each of the generators, kill the guards, and exit the dam for another job well done. So our next part of the plan involves acquiring four police bikes and storing them somewhere safe. Now, realistically, this would be very simple. I would walk out of the casino, shoot somebody, wait for a police bike, and then park in one of my many garages. Rinse, repeat, simple. Hell, the pad I bought up in the northeast corner of the map could probably hold four bikes, but no, that is not what we are doing. Instead, we have to drive around the whole city and find four specific police bikes, because it's not like there are four police stations in Ventura's. Then we have to take those bikes and catch up to a packer driving around the freeway which surrounds Ventura's and park each bike on the back, one at a time. This takes an absurd 12 minutes, and is mostly just a lot of driving around the Julius Thruway. With that done, there's only one job left though for the casino thread before the big heist, although we can't actually do that until we've dug more into the story missions. Our last setup mission in the GTA 5 lingo is to acquire a sky crane, which we will use to airlift a Caligula's van to our property at the aircraft graveyard. The problem is, acquiring one means getting through a bunch of guys armed with M4s. Now, I am sure there is a less painful way to have done this mission, but Arst if I could be bothered to do that. I went with brute force and came literally one bullet away from dying, but managed to survive all the way to the roof where you're ambushed by two hunters. Luckily, the game generously supplies you with a mounted minigun so they're pretty easy to deal with, and then all we gotta do is hop in the sky crane and fly halfway across the map. Twice. First to grab the van and then all the way out to the aircraft graveyard with the truck weighing down the heli the whole way and thus making it slower. With the van delivered though, we'll be ready to do the heist as early as we possibly can. Now that we're back at the aircraft graveyard, it seems like a good time to follow up on the Mike Torino mission thread, so let's go do that. Starting with one of my, and I think a lot of people's, least favorite missions in the game. This mission is another one that's very, very simple in concept, but in execution... <sighs> so, we gotta fly this plane from one end of the map to the other and back again. We also have to do it while maintaining a low altitude relative to the ground that we're over, which I don't think is how radar actually works on this scale, but sure, whatever. The worst part is actually something that I don't have to deal with anymore, or at least not much. See, back in the day on the PS2, the trees around Angel Pine, where you make the drop, would have a bad habit of rendering right as you crash into them, but not a moment before. I bet this mission led to a fair amount of broken controllers. These days, though, it's just a bit tedious and uninteresting, though at least the whole keep low to the ground thing keeps you on your toes the whole time. You have to make sure not only to avoid obstacles low to the ground, but also you have to take great care not to fly over either the GTA Universe's equivalent to Area 51, Area 69, nice, or the freaking naval base in San Fierro, both of which are basically directly on your path to Angel Pine from the airplane graveyard, so, you know, hopefully you know about those places ahead of time. Area 69 isn't even introduced until after the next mission, but you know, get good as Professor Cranky Kong would say. This last Mike Torino mission, or rather his last mission for this section of the game, involves speeding a bike onto a moving cargo plane and then blowing it up from the inside. The game immediately places you on the bike and you literally have to accelerate the moment the game allows you to and hold up on the control stick to gain a tiny bit more speed in order to just barely make it onto the plane. Back when I streamed this mission last year, I know I failed getting onto this plane a million times, so the fact that I got onto it first try here was pretty great. Then all you gotta do is avoid the Donkey Kong barrels rolling down the middle of the plane and fist fight a few goons on the plane, or beat them with a shovel as I did. At the back, you kill the guy with a parachute and then leap out to safety where... Oh. Oh, right. I, for I forgot to. Uh, one second. So the second time around, I instead beat all the goons inside with this giant purple dildo that I got from Benny, take the parachute, plant a satchel, and then leap out of the plane like Naked Snake. Then we get the coolest mission complete screen in the game, and, you know, good contender for the coolest one in the whole series. Now though, we have more missions at the graveyard, but they aren't from Mike Torino. See, apparently this whole time, the truth has been watching us, or somehow keeping tabs on us, enough to know about Torino, and he convinces Carl to follow him to a secret government facility. That's the Area 51 equivalent that I mentioned before. 
Now, I know Carl will do a lot of things for questionable reasons or meager compensation sometimes, but let me just lay this out for you. In one conversation, the truth convinces Carl to try and infiltrate Area 51 on his own and steal something that the truth doesn't actually know what it is, and whatever it is, bring it back to him. All for no money and no prior mentioning of this place or any of this. Hell, we don't even know how long it's been since Carl has seen the truth. Anyways. So, Truth drops us off at the front gates of Area 51 in the middle of the night, somehow, and we have to sneak in. Now, I know I've said that San Andreas has a half-baked stealth system, and in almost no other mission is it as obvious as this one. I actually tried for once to be stealthy here, and got spotted by the lights, and the game gives you a chance to hide, so I hide at this perfect little spot on the wall that seems like it was literally built for this specific reason, but somehow, the game still counts the lights as being able to see me here, despite, you know, it not being able to see me. And it puts the whole base on alert. It doesn't actually tell them where I am, so I still gotta go around using the godly powers of auto-aim to hopefully catch each of the fully armed soldiers before they have a chance to unload their clip of M4 ammo into my face, but whatever. I get into the facility the alternate way by shooting the vent and then systematically making my way through the cramped hallways, being very careful not to get caught off guard. And eventually, we have to steal a keycard to a door immediately next to us, and then we have to fight our way down this chute with soldiers all along the staircase going down to reach a jetpack. Now this, this right here, was worth the pain. When we finally get it, all we gotta do is fly straight up and then land it on the ridge out in the desert, where we hand it over to Truth, and then he abandons us on the plateau. Nice. It does spawn at the airport after the next mission though, so we will have access to it even without cheats, which is really nice. Inconvenient is all hell to reach during most missions, but super useful for completionists. The last mission we do for Truth in the game, as well as the last airport mission, involves using the jetpack that we just stole to steal yet another thing that we don't actually know what it is. This time, we have to intercept a train using the jetpack, kill the guards, and find a jar of green goo. Though Truth himself never actually identifies what we're looking for, so it's a good thing we grabbed the right thing. And that the other two crates were mysteriously empty, for some reason. Anyway. I find it quite amusing that for breaking into Area 51, we got no stars, and for stealing a jar of top secret whatever, we get two stars. Priorities, you see. This mission is actually a lot of fun and one of the only ones where the game supplies you with the jetpack from the start and encourages you to use it. Really, it's the only mission where you get to use it since by the time you finish Black Project, you're probably low on health and just want to fly the hell out of there, rather than try your luck on the many soldiers carrying the game's most powerful assault rifle, or, you know, the auto-targeting missiles that the base has. When we deliver it to the truth, I still have two stars, which leads to this glorious moment. I got something. Let me see. Ooh, everything is different now. What is it? Everything. They will call this Year Zero. I'll be in touch. Wait! What is... Yeah, see you around. Returning to the casino, we are now going to tackle the main story thread with the mission You've Had Your Chips. Woozy learns that the Sendakos have been manufacturing counterfeit chips at their plastics factory and intends to blow it up, but Carl volunteers to do it for him. The first time I did this mission, I actually flew here with the jetpack, and incredibly, it was still outside when I exited the cutscene, so I used it to fly to the factory. Unfortunately, as soon as I flew over the factory, a cutscene was triggered where it stripped me of my jetpack and dropped me in the middle of the firefight with dudes I would have otherwise been able to kill right behind me. I ended up killing everybody inside and destroying the machines, but once you destroy the last machine, a new wave instantly spawns into the factory and I was a bit careless, resulting in yet another death. <sighs> Remember that deathless run? It's times like these that make me really appreciate being able to buy back your guns in Vice City Stories. So, another tedious trip to ammunition later, and I repeat the mission, making heavy use of my fancy new Desert Eagle to kill everybody inside, including the second wave, and then return to the casino for a nice, clearly screwed up voice line, and yet another mission complete. And next up, we have Don Peyote, a mission where the truth calls Carl and asks him to help collect a pair of British rock stars that he was partying with in the desert, who ended up stranded through typical hippie drug antics. We drive out to the middle of the desert and meet my two favorite comedic relief characters in the series, Kent Paul and Macker. Macker especially makes me laugh as a fan of a lot of northern British bands like Oasis and the Stone Roses. This whole mission is basically just to introduce them and one more character. Once we pick them up, we try to locate the rest of the band at a snake farm that Carl mysteriously knows about. 
and then we end up having to fight off some rednecks as well as the cops. Then we head back to Venturas and bring the boys to that third character, another returning one from Vice City, and another favorite of mine, Ken Rosenberg. We find Rosenberg has been swept into some kind of deal where he acts as a middleman between multiple mafia families, all vying for full control of the casino rackets. Though we didn't work for him directly yet, we get to see just how desperate he is, and Carl sees a perfect opportunity to scope out Caligula's floor plan in person for the planned heist. In the next mission, Intensive Care, we actually begin to work for Ken Rosenberg by helping him to keep the many Mafia families circling him happy, in this case, the Sindacos. See, back in the first mission that we did for Woozy and Venturas, we tied a guy to the front of our car and drove him around town like a maniac, but he didn't die. In fact, he was a high-ranking Sindaco family member, and he recently recovered enough at the hospital to be returned to his people. Ken, however, not knowing that it was actually Carl, is terrified that whoever hurt Johnny to begin with will come back to finish the job, and thus put his own life in danger. So, Carl volunteers to safely transport Johnny for him, the same man that he himself tortured, to the Sindaco's meat factory. So we head down to the hospital to pick up Johnny, and Carl talks about how it's important that Johnny not wake up while he's driving him, but like, don't ambulances have like the driver section completely separated from the back? I don't know, but I'm pretty sure. Unless Carl is sitting up front alone chatting to himself, Johnny would never know. Then again, Carl says this before we realize we'll be transporting him in an ambulance. See, when we get to the hospital, Johnny has already been collected, so we have to drive around town and find the right ambulance with him in it. Kill the drivers, and then deliver him safely to the Sindaco factory. I ended up finding the ambulance with him in it just idling in the middle of the intersection, which was pretty weird. And what was even weirder was when I shot the driver and then casually drove Johnny to the factory with a Sundako goon sitting quietly to my right. Before we get back to the casino missions though, we now have a new crash mission available, even though we didn't get a phone call explaining that Tenpenny was in Venturas, yet more evidence that the later half of the game feels rushed. In this mission, we learn that the long arm of the law is inching closer and closer to actually nabbing the two corrupted LSPD officers, and Tenpenny tasks us with finding a DEA officer, meeting with an FBI guy out in the middle of the desert, and kill them, retrieving their dossier of incriminating evidence. Now, I remembered this mission being pretty difficult, so I stopped by ammunition, grabbed a bunch of sniper ammo just in case, and started driving towards the location. That's when I realized that I have a freaking jetpack at the airport, so why not actually use it for once? Doing that should make the mission a hell of a lot easier, so just fly over there, get a good vantage point, and swoop in. The goal here is to kill the guy actually carrying the dossier, because if we don't do it fast enough, he'll start flying away in a helicopter, which makes the whole mission a lot longer. Now, if you arrive here normally, you have a very small window to gun him down while also dealing with the many well-armed federal agents who surround him, but when you have a jetpack, however, you can just do this. You lost the wheel, Dib, yet? We don't actually bring the dossier to Tenpenny yet, though. That's for later. Getting back to business, the meat business specifically, we now go to help Rosenberg deal with the Johnny Sindaco situation after Ken Paul gets him hyped up by reigniting his cocaine addiction. Nice. So we drive a nervous Ken over to the Sindaco factory, and for some reason, Carl decides to go in with him when Ken begs him, instead of insisting that it would be a bad idea. Predictably, when Carl and Ken both go to meet Johnny, it gives Johnny a heart attack at the sight of the man who tortured him into a wheelchair, and he dies right there on the spot. Again, nice. Damn, that nigga fucked up. So now the name of the game is to fight our way out through a whole mess of Sendako goons, but thankfully, a bit of patience is all that's required here. When we get outside, it's just a clean drive to the casino again without anybody chasing us, so this one is pretty simple, but a good violent romp. I took another detour at this point though when I saw the big D on the radar screen. That means it's time to go and kinda sorta not really right or wrong that Carl did all the way back in Los Santos, ruining the life of rapper Mad Dog. We find him literally at the point of taking his own life, drunk out of his mind and walking along the edge of a high building. Some wise guys on the ground encourage him to jump but Carl decides he needs to save Dog due to I guess his guilt over destroying his career for a guy he barely even liked and who betrayed him shortly after. We grab a nearby truck, take care of that crowd, and then catch some iced tea before it can be spilt all over the damn ground. Even though Carl and Dog have literally had one conversation under these circumstances, when we drop him off, he immediately offers Carl the position of his new manager, something Carl has literally no experience doing, but he pretty much agrees. Next is a mission, which really doesn't count as an actual mission since, well, it's just a cutscene. When we go to the Four Dragons and officially sign the papers that make Carl a partner in the business alongside Woozy and Ron Fali. 
we toast to a prosperous future robbing people, and then head back to Caligula's to deal with another old character making a comeback. After fish in a barrel, you see, we get a phone call from Ken letting us know that one of the many puppeteers pulling his strings has come down to Ventura as himself, Salvatore Leone. Upon being introduced to Salvatore, Carl immediately pulls on his history with Salvatore's son Joey back when Carl lived in Liberty City, which I guess technically means that Carl was an actual Leone family associate during the 80s. Salvatore says that a crew of Ferelli hitmen are on their way to Ventura's via plane to try and assassinate him, and he wants us to prove how useful we can be by intercepting them. This mission sounds a lot cooler than it actually is, and it kind of feels like a bit of a test run for the next mission, which has a similar opening, but a much more satisfying second half. We drive on over to the airport and hop into one of these tiny little planes, and then we have to fly for what seems like ever until we find the Ferelli jet en route to Ventura's airport. The hard part about this mission is actually just spotting the plane and turning around fast enough to still catch up to it before you reach land, but as long as you can actually touch the corona and trigger the cutscene, you've basically already won. Unless you're really, really, really bad at flying. Once the cutscene plays, you're thrown into an on-rail shooter first-person type section, which is honestly a joke. Maybe if the guys in the plane were packing M4s, this would be a challenge, but as it stands, they literally plink away at you with 9mm, and you can just hide behind cover when they literally never get you. Shoot each of the four dudes, and then the pilot comes out like he's some sort of boss and says, I'm not going down without a fight, literally as he dies, having done nothing. Once everyone on board is dead, we take control of the jet, and then all we have to do is land back at the airport. Simple. Kind of tedious, but simple. But before we get to the mission that one prepared us for, so to speak, we have a very important story mission to get to. We get a phone call after freefall from our good buddy Officer Frank Tenpenny, and he asks us to finally meet with him, and that dossier we retrieved, in the middle of nowhere. Nice, clean air. When we get to the ghost town where the mission starts, Crash pulls up, including Hernandez for the first time in a million years, and Pulaski takes the dossier from Carl. Almost immediately afterwards, Tenpenny assaults Hernandez with a shovel, claiming it was him who sold them out to the feds. I find it funny that Hernandez literally never has any lines of dialogue in the final game and cutscenes. He speaks to Carl once on the phone, and he has fully voiced cutscene dialogue in the introduction, but in the final console versions of the game, you only ever hear him speak once, and even when he's knocked out to the ground and beaten with a shovel, he doesn't even groan or make a single noise. So Tenpenny fucks off and leaves Pulaski to guard us while we dig a grave for both Hernandez and ourselves, I guess? You know, I'm not exactly sure why Carl would bother to begin digging a grave he knows he'll be put in when Crash has very little left to hang over him besides his own life, but whatever. Luckily for Carl, as we're digging and CJ is trying to make Pulaski see reason, Hernandez wakes up since it turns out he isn't dead yet. Hernandez goes to try and attack Pulaski, but he turns at the last moment and shoots him, with Hernandez landing in the grave that was being dug for him anyway. And then the cutscene ends and all of a sudden Pulaski is running away. It's quite jarring. I guess the insinuation here is that Carl used that last second to try and steal Pulaski's gun or do something to make him run, but what we actually get is just a jump cut basically to Pulaski heading for his car. We gain control outside the cemetery with a buggy right next to us, and then we have to give chase, but this is it. Our chance to finally put down one of the most obnoxious and toxic characters in the game. This chase isn't too bad. If you throw Pulaski off even a little, he will desperately try to get back onto a scripted route, making it easy to just shoot at his car until it either blows up or he gets out. Oh, you want to go, huh? Well, bring it on! Huh. I wasn't prepared for that. Okay, so buy all my guns, again, and return to actually use the auto-aim this time, and... There we go, jeez. Not feeling so fucking full of yourself now, huh? <coughs> yeah, well, them's the brakes, fuck. Any last requests? Yeah. Can I fuck your sister? You an asshole to the end. Punk motherfucker. Well, with Pulaski dead, we are finally entering into what is basically the game's final act. We only have a couple more missions before we pack up and head back to Los Santos. So, before we do that, let's go deal with Caligula's situation by doing one more job for Salvatore Leone. Now, this is probably one of the coolest missions in the game, and definitely one that everybody remembers. In this mission, we are tasked by Salvatore with actually flying all the way to Liberty City to assassinate Franco Ferrelli at the St. Mark's Bistro, a location players are probably quite familiar with, but this time, we actually get to set foot inside. Now, we do actually have to fly there ourselves, but luckily, the game does not make you traverse like two hours of ocean, and once you're far enough from the edge of San Andreas, you will trigger a cutscene that takes you to Liberty City. Carl takes a taxi from the airport to St. Mark's Bistro, and we get to see a rare glimpse of Liberty City covered in snow. Then we're thrown inside the bistro for a shootout against half the Ferrelli family. Now the first time I came, I came well armed, 
and slowly worked my way through the baddies until, for some reason, I found Franco stuck in the hallway. Normally, he would shoot at you a bit and then run off, and eventually you kill him in the back courtyard, but this time, he just stayed there, firing at me with his dual-wielding submachine guns, and they did quite a bit of damage. By the time I realized how screwy things were, I was also just plain screwed. Well, damn it. That was a lot of guns, and I'd used basically the last of my cheat money to get them, and I didn't want to cheat any more than the one time I already did. So eventually I decided to just buy a whole bunch of pistol ammo and just wing it, taking the enemy's weapons as I could. I ended up dying again, but all three times, including the final time when I actually beat it, Franco stayed in his corner and never went down to the courtyard. It was kind of weird actually, since I think it messed with the spawning. The kitchen was basically empty, and the actual courtyard had like one dude, who after dying, finally triggered the end of the mission. We get back to San Andreas and get a phone call from Salvatore thanking us for a job well done and telling us to lie low. Then immediately after that, we get a phone call from Woozy indicating it's finally time to pull off the heist. Aw, hell yeah. Now, this mission is arguably the basis for Grand Theft Auto V, which is why it's so strange that this mission thread and the finale are completely optional for finishing the game. You can easily complete the main story and then return to Venturas to pull off the heist or just never do it at all. The game does not care. They are treated the same as the San Fierro Garage missions. The actual mission thread leading up to this and the finale itself though very clearly served as heavy inspiration for what the team would do when they returned to San Andreas again nine years later. The finale begins with Carl heading to the casino in his stolen uniform and coordinating over comms with the rest of the team on the police bikes and inside the Caligula's cash truck. We get to the casino and are guided by Zero to the back rooms where our first job is to knock out the security guards watching the vault by tossing some knockout gas down a ventilation shaft. Then we have to make our way to the garage as the lights of the casino go out when we basically blow up Hoover Dam, which means we also got to use a forklift to raise the garage door since the power is gone. Once the team is inside, we also have to destroy the backup generators when the casino tries to bring the power back online. Once we destroy the generators, we can finally get inside the vault and grab that sweet money, but this is also when our first wave of Mafia baddies shows up. From here, we just have to work our way through the enemies with the triads behind us and reach the garage where we brought them in. And as they escape with the actual cash, we head to the roof to serve as the decoys and escape by parachuting off the roof to a nearby building where we have to steal a helicopter and get the fuck out of Dodge. As we work our way up, though, we have to contend with yet more baddies, but the lights come back on as it's revealed that Zero bragged about the robbery to freaking Berkeley of all people, and so he's been working to thwart us to spite Zero. Eventually, we reach the roof and have to jump. Now, I almost always miss landing on the parallel roof here and end up having to drive my way out to the aircraft graveyard, but this time, I actually did it the intended way and got away with minimal drama, so that was cool. When we finally get to the aircraft graveyard, Carl punches Zero in the face for telling Berkeley, and then Woozy tells Carl to chill followed by immediately telling Carl to take him home like a schoolgirl after the prom. Better take me home, CJ. Now this mission overall is a lot of fun, but parts like the very ending cutscene and the various other parts scream of it being unfinished or at least rushed to completion. It feels like there was way more ideas here than the team had time to fully flesh out, and there are various points throughout the planning missions and the finale that just make it feel a little bit sloppy. Still, it's very clearly something that the team enjoyed working on and wanted to expand on, which is probably why it ended up being such a major focus the next time that we went to San Andreas. With the mission complete, we also get a cool $100,000, our best payout yet, and one of the best, if not the best, in the game. And now all we have to do is the mission which will take us back to Los Santos for the final chapter of the game's story. It's time to head back to Mad Dog's Mansion. So, remember how we completely screwed over Mad Dog and basically pushed him to the point of jumping off a balcony? But then we saved his life and made it all better? Well, like I said back then, we're basically Mad Dog's manager, and now he gets to talking about going back to LS, until it's finally revealed that Dog's mansion was seized by a drug dealer, Big Papa, and he has no way to actually go back home at the moment. CJ completely unloads into Dog, and considering that a lot of this is his fault, it doesn't really paint him in a great light. And then we're all off to LS with Dog, Kendall, and Caesar stopping in San Fierro to check on things, while we go with Woozy's triads to take back the mansion by force. Now, this mission is one of the crazier ones in the game, and it can be a lot of fun. It can also be a giant pain in the ass. I feel like I say that a lot, so nothing new. We first have to leap from the plane and land on the helipad, or really anywhere close, and then fight off the Vagos gangsters for quite a while. Eventually, some special triads land with us, and we have to make sure to keep them alive during the onslaught, and that's easy enough when it comes to the actual Vagos. I end up dying inside at one point too, because it's tight corridor shooting for a considerable length through the mansion, which is quite a bit bigger on the inside than it looks from the outside. We chase Big Papa all the way to the other side of the mansion, where he takes off in his car, and we're given a glorious pink Windsor to follow him with. Then we just gotta take him out, and bam, we're back in Los Santos, and now we have a mansion. 
or we're supposed to. For some weird reason, probably related to the PC version, the save icon never appears inside Dog's Mansion for me, even though it distinctly shows the save icon on the minimap. Not sure what's going on here. But even though we're back in LS, we still have a number of loose ends to tie up before we get to the end game proper, starting with Mr. G-Man himself, Mike Torino. As soon as CJ and company settle back into LS, he brings Ken Rosenberg and Kent Paul in to help produce a new record for Mad Dog, and during one of his first new recording sessions, they're interrupted by the voice of God, or rather, Hades. Torino tells us that he has one last job for us before we can finally see Sweet released as early as this week. It's simple. You just gotta steal a military jet off an amphibious assault ship and use it to destroy a flotilla of spy ships. Nothing big. Nice and easy. So Torino drives us to the shore near San Fierro's airport and gives us a boat with a silenced pistol on board and that's it. Now, we aren't stripped of our weapons or anything, so we already had what we had coming in, but still, if you don't come armed, you'll basically have to do this mission stealthy as it can be a bit of a hard one. Now, me on the other hand, I came well armed with both bullets and loads of incompetence. You see? And this just makes things simple. Now all I gotta do is not die as I fight off the crew of an entire US Navy ship to reach and somehow steal an F-16 or Hydra or whatever. It's actually not that bad, as long as you don't get lost and end up on the top deck where you absolutely do not need to go. You just gotta disable the SAM sites, and then go to the Hydra on the middle deck, which is guarded by all of like one or two guys. From there, it's just a matter of not sucking at flying a Hydra. Luckily for me, my chat taught me how to do it properly when I played this mission for my stream last year, so this next part ended up being pretty easy. You have to first fight off a couple of enemy jets that are targeting you, and then you have to head all the way to the top of the map to destroy a couple of boats just chilling out doing nothing. Once they're destroyed, you just have to land the Hydra at the aircraft graveyard since Torino seemingly abandons us at the end, but at the very least, this now means we have access to the Hydra, which is pretty cool. Now, when I started this mission, I had a pretty nice arsenal, and basically the last arsenal I would be able to buy with the money I had. So, when I made it through Vertical Bird without dying, I felt pretty good. In fact, I knew that beating Vertical Bird meant that now I could go see Mike Torino's ranch in Tierra Robata and collect infinite minigun ammo, or whatever other heavy weapon I wanted, and basically make the last parts of the game trivial. So, I beat the mission and flew my jet over to the ranch, knowing the game would give me a parachute so I would just be... Uh, let's not dwell on this one, okay? What's the next mission? Well, it's a pretty simple, mostly story-based mission where Mike Torino shows up to give us one last job again, and as it turns out, it's just picking up Sweet from prison. We drive down to the police precinct, since I guess he got moved from wherever he was upstate, and pretty quickly, the differences between the two brothers start to rear their ugly heads. Carl is excited to show Sweet everything he's done since Sweet went to prison. The mansion, the garage in Fierro, the casino in Venturas. Wants to buy Sweet new clothes and make him look the part. Sweet, on the other hand, only wants to do one thing, go back to the hood. CJ tries to explain to him that there's nothing there for him anymore, but Sweet insists that that is exactly his problem with Carl, and demands they go back, so that's what we'll do. The rest of the mission is just driving to Grove Street and killing a couple of dealers, since the place has been overrun by crackheads. Then Sweet sulks back home, and we are given one of our last mission thread choices. Well, realistically, I should have done all the Grove missions in a row, and then gone from this to cutthroat business, but instead I ended up tying up a different loose end of sorts. So, do you remember Beat Up? If you don't, I don't blame you. He was in all of one cutscene and all of one mission, but he apparently became a high-ranking Ballas lieutenant under Big Smoke after we left LS. This mission is framed as getting back at him, but don't get too excited, it's a bit of a lie. See, all of the sweet missions in this part of the game are basically the same, just the game's territory mechanic. Fight one or a couple of gang fights, and then maybe one big bad at the end, like in this mission. So here we gotta take back Glen Park, and afterwards we get the chance to confront Beat Up. However, we don't actually get to kill him as like a final boss of the area or anything. Instead, Big Bear just kind of shoves him at the end of the cutscene and decides to join up with the Grove, leaving Beat Up's fate ambiguous. As well as Bear's, honestly. Bear is one of those characters that seems to have had a lot more planned for him than what we actually got. This cutscene here is the last we see of him, with Sweet driving him off to rehab. Apparently, I've heard that at one point we were meant to drive Bear ourselves, where we would have had a conversation with him on the way, presumably perhaps revealing more of his backstory and connection to the Johnson family. Instead, he's whisked away and never seen again. Our next mission is the one that I mentioned before, and the one that many people were always looking forward to, but once again, don't get excited. They're just gonna blue ball us. Sort of. Okay, so, in this mission, we are presumably going after OG Loke for... I guess for betraying the Johnson clan by working with Smoke, but on the surface, it's framed as revenge for Mad Dog, and I mean, Dog, everything related to Loke in your career is Carl's fault, and not Smoke's. So we find Loke at a photo shoot behind the trucker place that we went to with Catalina, and we begin a two-part chase across Los Santos, this first part being in a hovercraft. 
I actually was able to follow Loke a lot closer than I feel like I was ever able to before, knowing his route fairly well. Eventually, we reached the end of the Santa Maria Pier, and there's randomly just three go-karts waiting there. Loke jumps on one, and instead of, like, shooting him or tackling him there, Carl and Dog wait patiently for Loke to get in this cart and drive away, before hopping in theirs and beginning this very twisted Mario Kart course. This is another thing that feels sloppy and thrown together, or just very gamey, I guess. I mean, they couldn't have had, like, a go-kart race that, you know, that was already going, that we interrupt. There's just three go-karts waiting there that Loke knew about, I guess? Who knows? Then we just have to chase Loke through the streets on yet another vehicle that's almost never seen before this mission, the go-kart, and eventually, finally, we corner him at Blast and Fool's Records, but it just kind of transitions to us being inside. We don't see Loke get off his cart or anything, just one second he's driving, the next Carl and Dog have him cornered inside. Then comes the blue balling. See, arguably, again, all of this, or a lot of this anyway, is Carl's fault. But the game has framed Loke as an antagonist, and this mission is supposed to be us getting back at him. But we don't get to kill him or anything of the sort. The best we get is CJ telling him to get lunch, and then he too is never seen again. I don't know if you're noticing a trend with this last act of the game, but uh, I am. Our next mission is Grove for Life, and it involves, you guessed it, taking back gang territory just like the last sweet mission. This time, there's even less story to justify this one, as all we do is take back two Idlewood neighborhoods, and that's it. Mission complete. There is literally nothing else to say about this one. Well, actually, there is something I can talk about now, the gang territory mechanic. So early on into the game, the first time you're in Los Santos, you are introduced to the gang territory mechanic, specifically in the mission Doberman. The game never tells you that it's going to completely strip away the feature after the first act, so lots of people probably spent a considerable amount of time getting territories early on, only to find out that it's pointless. When the mechanic is reintroduced at this later stage in the game, it just feels like padding. We have to take over 35% of all territories in Los Santos in order to access the final mission of the game. Like it's fucking Mario 64. And that means a whole lot of grinding to get it done. Thankfully, by this point, you've likely also completed Vertical Bird, which means we basically have infinite minigun ammo. Now, if you do what I did and spend like 20 minutes saving and loading at Torino's Ranch until you have so much minigun ammo that the counter disappears in order to make the gang fights and basically the whole final act trivial when it comes to any combat, then you'll be fine. But we shouldn't have to do this. The gang mechanic, as far as I know, was also originally meant to apply to both San Fierro and Las Venturas too, with gangs like the Danang Boys, San Fierro Rifa, and the various Mafia families. But, like a lot of things, the feature was cut. Almost. Instead of being removed entirely or completed, the feature was left in despite its unfinished nature, like a lot of things that crop up the later you get into San Andreas' story. Speaking of story, our next mission is yet again one that shouldn't actually count as a mission though it is nonetheless one of the more interesting points in the story due to its examination of real-world events in Los Angeles in 1992, specifically the LA riots. The mission riot is just a cutscene followed by a drive, because in that cutscene we learn that, much like his real-world analog Rafael Perez, implicated in the Rampart scandal, a trial is held for Tenpenny that quickly becomes national news, which surrounds his various allegations of corruption, many of which we have personally helped to quash. Thanks in large part to Carl's actions, no doubt, Tenpenny and Pulaski, who is not yet known to be dead, are both acquitted of all charges, and within moments, half the city of Los Santos erupts into violent rioting, outraged by the outcome. Again, all of this, based around the very real-world setting of the LA riots, makes for a fascinating mission, even if you don't actually do much of anything. As you're driving from Mad Dog's mansion to Grove Street, the game puts Los Santos into riot mode, and pedestrians begin wandering the streets with stolen TVs, cop cars are set ablaze, and randomly fights break out on every corner. It's really quite an interesting part of the game that doesn't get explored all that much since the effect only lasts for another two missions after this. Speaking of which... Alright, we're getting close to the end here. This is the penultimate mission in the game, and thankfully, for once, it's not quite as simple as using the game's territory mechanic. Now, we do have to help Caesar retake much of the Azteca's former territory alongside some of his trusted lieutenants, the few who remain, but what it amounts to is a short gauntlet of Vagos. Now, I took a minigun into this mission like a lot of these last ones, which makes it a hell of a lot easier, but another thing that I remember from my playthrough of the game on stream last year was failing this mission because I accidentally used the minigun on my allies, which is exceedingly easy to do since the minigun is one of the few guns that has no auto-aim. Having a gun like this honestly feels like cheating at this point, as it makes many encounters trivial, like this one. But right after completing it, I got my just desserts when a cop car decided to just park on me. Still asshole. Away, 
Well, I took this as cosmic guidance or some shit and decided to go into the final mission as legit as I could. I've got no fireproof from cheats or doing the fire truck missions. I've got no minigun, but I do have just over $100,000 to buy an arsenal that would make any gorilla jealous. I'm sure I'll have a hell of a time. So here we go, final mission. We get the phone call from Sweet saying he's found Big Smoke in East Los Santos, which means it's time to wrap up our final two loose ends and bring the game's main story to a close. With the riots still going on, we drive over to the Crack Palace, as it's called, in East Los Santos. Here, Carl pleads with Sweet to let him do all the fighting, as a way to make up for letting Brian, their younger brother, die, as he puts it, and whatever else Sweet has against CJ. And eventually, reluctantly, Sweet agrees, saying he'll be in the car should he need him. And then, we're off. Now, once again, the game spells out exactly what we need to do here, which is first steal a SWAT tank and use it to literally break into the building. This vehicle is only, and I mean only seen, this one time in this one specific context. It's never used again when you have four stars or more, and it's not found anywhere in the world before or after, as far as I know. And this is yet another example of something that feels rushed or forgotten about, which really sucks, because for the 15 seconds you actually get to use this thing, it's pretty cool. We smash through the front door and begin our ascent up four floors of Balas, Vagos, and even Russians, I think. This mission is an absolute gauntlet. An endurance test, and a test of your patience. You need to come well armed, and if you didn't make a save before starting it, God help you. Floor 1 is security. Floor 2 is the drug lab. Floor 3 is the Ballas Lounge, though it's conspicuously got a lot of Vagos, so 0 out of 10 on the name. And then finally, we'll reach Floor 4, where we confront Big Smoke, and we get to see him one time and one time only completely drop the mask. Hey, Smoke! Hey, CJ, I was wondering when you would show up. How'd you know it was me? Knew it was my old dog, CJ. Knew you was coming and I don't give a shit. I'm here to take care of your fat ass. Then I'ma take care of your friends in the police department. Where they at? Man, fuck this shit. <coughs> Man, that's some good shit. Man, you and Ten Penny. And fuck Ten Penny. And fuck his Polish lapdog. And fuck the police, man. Oh, that's old shit. Look at you. You got the whole world. I ain't got no regrets, man. Smoke, you have. I made a CJ. I'm a success. I can't be touched. I don't give a fuck. Fuck the whole world. What happened to you, man? Man, what the fuck do you care? Uh, I guess we better do this shit then. What follows is a pretty underwhelming boss fight where Smoke runs around the room shooting at you and bringing in goons, and it all takes place in the dark, so very likely the fight will be a vibrant shade of fluorescent green, which is just lovely. When you finally do gun him down, we get one last cutscene where Smoke admits to getting caught up in the power and money before finally dying. Hey, Smoke, what made you flip out like that, man? Was it the drugs or what? I got caught up in the money, <coughs> the power. I don't give a shit. Oh, fuck, man. <coughs> Why you just didn't quit, man? Uh, uh, we was like family, homie. I had no choice. I had to do it. I just see the opportunity. <coughs> oh, when I'm gone, everyone gonna remember my name. Big Smoke. Oh. Uh, uh. Carl doesn't get long to think about his situation though, as immediately after Smoke's death, our good buddy Tenpenny shows up. Carl Johnson, my man. I need you to do me another favor. You kill Pulaski, now this fat fuck? There's no stopping you. Drop the gun. You ain't leaving here alive, man. Where's your brother at, huh? Why you just didn't shoot me in the back? Feeling exposed, huh? Shut your dumb ass up and load the bag. Come on, let's go. I ain't got time to fuck with you. So what it's like, Ten Penny? Huh? All alone? Nobody got your back? Suck, huh? Why you think I'm alone? I got a couple of rookies outside. But I gotta open their eyes slowly, you know. Little truth here, little truth there. Alright, fuck it. That's enough. Chuck it over. I got a fire truck to catch. You crazy, man. Lost. You 
gone. Half the city's looking for cops to kill, Carl. And I ain't about to get dragged out of a patrol car and get beat to death by some angry mob. No, no, not tonight. What you catching? A plane? Ding, 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 ding! Good answer, Carl! You know, you're gonna thank me one day for opening your fucking eyes. Oh, I almost forgot, Carl. Time to die. Ah, uh, sweet! What? Mother... It ain't over, Carl! It ain't over! So now comes my least favorite part of the mission whenever I've played it in the past. It's kind of like that part in Ocarina of Time where you have to reach the bottom of Ganon's castle before it crumbles with you still inside, but this time it's a crack palace and the building is going to burn down. So we have to slowly and methodically make our way through all the floors that we went through to get up here, only now some things are on fire, and we have to actually stop and use the extinguisher to clear a path. What fun. On top of that, the power stays out, so we'll have to keep using our night vision goggles at the risk of being able to see exactly jack and shit while making our way through the heavily armed baddies. Eventually, we reach the bottom floor, and Carl makes a superhero leap through the flames, which triggers the final section of the mission, the chase sequence, which itself is broken up into two more parts. The first part of the chase involves us driving and just keeping up with Tenpenny long enough and not getting run off the damn road. Now, if you make it to this point in the mission and die, the game is nice enough to make any future attempts start the mission here, something it doesn't do for literally any other mission, which goes to show just how long this one is, but still. After following Tenpenny long enough, one of the rookies that he mentioned earlier will climb out of the fire truck and try to stomp on Sweet's hands, meaning we have to position the car under him as quickly as we can to catch him, where the Johnson brothers will then switch places, and we begin the very last section of the gameplay, where we shoot instead of drive. Here it's a lot like the mission reuniting the families, where we just need to keep the cops and the other baddies chasing us off us long enough to trigger the final cutscene. Shooting at Tenpenny's fire truck is completely pointless and a waste of ammo, so just focus on the cops primarily and the gangsters, and eventually, Tenpenny will crash his truck right off the Ganton Bridge overlooking Grove Street. Be sure sober, man. That's all. It's cool. Don't need to put a bullet in him. He killed himself in a traffic accident. No one to blame. Let's roll. Hey, far out, man. You know, I mean, you beat the system. I tried for 30 years to cross over, but you managed it, man. I mean, man, you're an icon, man. Oh, thanks, man. I'm just glad it's finally over. What's up with Smoke? You know what's up with Smoke. He always saw things a little different than us. Smoke? Smoke was always on his own, always out for self. That is the surest path to hell, man. Well, that are 15 microdots and an ounce of mescaline. Let's go get something to eat. Sounds good to me. See you around, officer. The gang, including for some reason the truth, who hasn't made an appearance for a while, all show up to witness the death of Frank Tenpenny, knowing that things are finally over. 
and we learned through the radio after that his body was basically torn to shreds by looters, so it's got to be one of the most brutal deaths for a GTA antagonist, if you ask me. We get one final cutscene where Mad Dog shows up with Paula Macker to announce his first gold record, and things finally seem to have calmed down. With the Johnson siblings getting along again, well enough anyways, Mad Dog's rapping career taking off, and Carl a successful businessman, entrepreneur, and straight up killer. Credits. Where are you off to now? Finna hit the block. See what's happening. So what are my final thoughts on the story in San Andreas? Well, like I'm sure I have said a couple of times, it feels like it wants to be a whole bunch of things and fails to commit to any one of those ideas, all of which feel like they could have been a full game. Like the gangster setting of Act 1, the countryside sections after Los Santos and San Fierro, the casino storyline in Venturas, or the drug ring in Fierro. All of them feel thrown together and kind of forced to cooperate. We kind of jump from one story beat to another and often leave things we've invested considerable time into only for them to never be mentioned or relevant again. That being said, what's still here is very often thoroughly entertaining. I think my biggest gripes with San Andreas come down to what it feels like it could have been. This game feels like it needed to be twice as long or even longer in order to fully flesh out the ideas and characters it continuously introduces because even as it stands, this game feels massive. Feels is a key word there because even if GTA 4 and 5 are far bigger by comparison, San Andreas still feels absolutely massive, and driving around the state can still give you that sense of going on a road trip across parts of California and Nevada, especially with the classic graphics and the fog effect drawing attention away from the pitiful PS2 era draw distances. At this point, I've veered off of talking about the story and just started talking about the game, so let's get more into that. There's a whole lot more to love here beyond just the story missions. So one thing that I think most people got out of the Grand Theft Auto games that was beyond the story missions was just existing in this massive virtual world that reacts to your presence in so many interesting ways. From the many, many lines of dialogue pedestrians will say, to random police chases going on independent of your actions, to the in-game advertisements be they radio or billboard. The world of Grand Theft Auto is a parody of the United States, which effectively boils down to taking every American stereotype and dialing it up to 11, while also nestling in relatively real stories inside that world. In fact, it occasionally feels like the more serious tone the game's story is often going for is thrown off by the more ridiculous aspects of the world. However, this is a very light criticism and one that applies more broadly to a lot more than just San Andreas. Even if you barely touch the story missions or never do anything beyond the necessary introductions, you can and very well may have gotten a whole lot out of Grand Theft Auto San Andreas simply by existing in the world that Rockstar managed to create. By today's standards, it's very crude, so it's hard to say if I would feel this way if I played San Andreas for the first time today, but as it stands, nostalgia and all gripes and flaws included, San Andreas is a fantastic experience that, if anything, just leaves me wanting more. Most of my problems with the game boil down to wanting the game the developers clearly wanted to make, which, like so many other projects of this scale, was limited by the necessity of getting the game onto store shelves. Something that also makes me oddly nostalgic given the state of things in the industry 20 years later. Well, not quite, but almost 20 years ago, which is just insane to me, as I can still remember going to try and rent this game at the height of the hot coffee controversy and being unable to. So, trophy time. What do we got today? First up, we have the Almost an RPG Award. San Andreas tried to be a lot of things. One of those things was an RPG, but honestly, in the ways that matter, it kind of succeeded. Now, granted, this could be applied to most of the other GTA games, but San Andreas' scope, both in terms of the map and in terms of new mechanics, really does make you feel like you're living in this world, and for me at least, almost makes me feel like I'm Carl Johnson, with the ability to make Carl lose or gain weight, date several women across the state, buy property, and even go to school, sort of. While all of this is great, it often leaves me just wishing it was an actual RPG, which is why I give it the almost caveat. Still, definitely a lot to love here for those who wanted more of the game beyond a really expensive stress relief doll. Next up, we have the Handsome Frank Award. Across the entire series, it's hard to say if there's ever been a better antagonist than Samuel L. Jackson's portrayal of the filthy crash officer, Frank Tenpenny. His presence, both on screen and in game, is top tier, especially in the game's first act in Los Santos. Tenpenny acts as effectively the man running the one gang you'll never outcompete, the cops. He uses and abuses his authority to make us hate him, and he does a damn fine job of it, being one of my all time favorite video game antagonists, and one of my favorite two from across the series. You done good, Frankie. You done good. And lastly, we have the Best Map Award. This one's pretty self-explanatory, though it requires a tiny bit of clarification. Of the 3D-era GTA games, that is GTA 3, Vice City, San Andreas, Advance, LCS, and VCS, San Andreas easily takes the cake for having the best map. Hell, 
Other than its smaller scale, there are times when I enjoy this map more than 4s or 5s. If I feel like just driving around while listening to some tunes, it's usually 5 or this that I'll boot up, just to do a lap or two around the state. The only GTA where we've had multiple full-size cities, just an overall fantastic place to explore. San Andreas might have one of my favorite video game maps, period, and even now, nearly 20 years later, it feels like I'm still finding new locations or seeing things I'd never noticed before, much like one of my other favorite games. GTA San Andreas is, in a word, ambitious. GTA 3 came out in 2001, Vice City in 2002, and San Andreas just two years later in 2004. The team at Rockstar North pushed themselves to get this one out and likely went right to work on the likes of GTA 4 after it finally did release, with other Rockstar Studios handling the spin-off games afterwards. There's definitely a reason why San Andreas frequently makes appearances on lists of the greatest games of all time, certainly from this era, and most definitely for the PlayStation 2. I may have my various complaints about it, but it's only because I love this game, and I wish it could be even more than what it ultimately is. Let's also briefly touch on the absolutely fantastic soundtrack that San Andreas has thanks to its impressive library of licensed music. James Brown, The Who, Leonard Skinner, Ozzy Osbourne, Too Short, Big Daddy Kane, NWA, the list goes on and on. Much like Vice City and basically every Grand Theft Auto title beyond the 2D era, the music on the radio in this game really does sell the atmosphere of the mid-90s perfectly. Combine it with the stellar performances of the radio cast, and it does go quite a long way in making the world feel real and lived in. Maybe not believable, but this is a parody after all, but it really does help to complete the picture. Speaking of the cast, beyond just Samuel L. Jackson, one of the greatest villains of all time, we have incredible performances, many of which came from local rap and hip-hop artists in the LA area, who lent both their voices and their authenticity towards the story that Rockstar was telling. MC8, Young Melee, Kid Frost, as well as plenty of returning heavy hitters like Frank Vincent as Salvatore Leone and William Fitchner as Ken Rosenberg. There's also plenty of new faces to the GTA world whose celebrity voices so perfectly fit the characters they play, like Charlie Murphy as the pitiful pimp Jizzy B, James Woods as the wonderfully manipulative G-man Mike Torino, Peter Fonda as the eccentric hippie The Truth, or Ice-T as the alcoholic rap superstar Mad Dog. The talent of both the cast on the radio and in the world are absolutely fantastic and it's an absolute pleasure to interact with them every time I play. So yeah, that's about it. San Andreas is definitely one of my favorite games, and a fantastic one at that, but I often find myself wishing it was more whenever I play it these days. By no stretch of the imagination is it a bad game, but perhaps occasionally too ambitious for its own good. For what it sets out to do though, which is to be an enormous and fairly accessible open world for people to run around and cause havoc in, it does an incredible job, just like every GTA before and after it. I will always come back to San Andreas for a good jaunt around my favorite 3D era locations like San Fierro and Las Venturas, but I am at least one step removed from being able to simply praise it to the end of the earth and back without end. I see its flaws. I see its strengths too, but it's a tiny bit easier for me to look at this one beyond my time with it as a kid since most of my vivid memories are of Vice City and 4. So this has been another episode of The Game Vault. Thank you all so very much for watching, and if you've made it this far that means you're one of the few. If you're still watching this late into the video, consider checking out some of the other Game Vault episodes, or watch my pseudo-documentary series Grand Theft Auto Biographies or Grand Theft Auto Geographies. If you enjoyed what you saw today, consider supporting me by becoming a patron over at patreon.com forward slash Guinness Walker. Even if you can't afford to support me directly, you can support me by checking out my executive producer's channels. Links in the description. I'll see you guys next time, where we may just be exploring a brand new series that I've yet to touch on for this channel. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you then. Peace out.